hello everyone uh, welcome uh, here so let's start the proceedings of the in house meeting 2023 with the uh, uh, address from our director professor tarun shoradip uh, let's start let's invite him i'm really very happy to be at this really amazing delightful event that i discovered last year uh, i mean there are few things that are very unique about it uh, rri has fairly diverse uh, diverse uh, research areas all within physics but it is more diverse than uh, other places uh, many places so it's very important to have these kind of meetings where uh, people come together and see what everyone else is doing and also you know showcase what they are doing uh, but that's only a part of it this could have been a regular institute event i, I think the most uh, uh, salient point is that it's all organized by students okay and there are few things that are very important about it <coughs> one is uh, you should realize and this was oft you know mentioned to us by more senior people some not here that when you sit here uh, you know in my eyes many of you i uh, will be sitting where some of these guys are sitting in a couple of decades right so it's very important to understand how science happens and to understand anything you need to participate right that's very important you know uh, we often think that everything can be found in a book or you take a co online course or you know some guru will tell you how to manage your life that's not how things work in my opinion the only way things work is to get down and do things so as you organize these meetings you may or may not realize it may be taking time away from you it may be doing this uh, other things but it's very important for you and you will benefit so i really encourage you to do this uh, you know and you are already doing this and i'm already happy to note that you have already added some features i think the quiz is something new and going forward i would also i think i mentioned this last time but it shouldn't stop at just an annual event you know so you should consider something like a journal club right um, something and i'm saying this in this forum not at a faculty meeting because i think it will be more successful if the students run it okay and there are you know instances where i know the students run it very well so it's not something that's a enormous task and so you should consider doing that you know consider uh, talks and if you are hesitant about and you can have other talks where you, if you don't want faculty members to come and you know uh, express their wisdom then you can have other talks in the evenings with students the other thing i really felt uh, would help is we have often visitors who are sitting here in this camp beautiful campus it's beautiful but it's very lonely so if you catch them i'm sure they'll be happy to interact with you okay so i remember this from my own experience uh, i was in an institute which was just coming up hardly anything every visitor starting from ashok sen to you know even nobel laureates who used to visit we used to catch them for a evening talk only for students we used to call them pep talks and i think i've never learned more from there i mean the best string theory introduction i have heard is ashok sen's 2 hours you know he just said okay i will come and give a chalkboard thing he spent 2 hours with us you know these are very vital and this cannot be instituted this cannot be your guide telling you or you know me telling you is even further from that so please you know think about it and get involved participate in this academic you know world and then you'll see that that's the true benefit you will get okay so i don't want to spend more time giving i mean i thought i need to give you some words of wisdom so i done that so i'll move on to my talk it's right about time and uh, this works right okay so i wasn't smart enough to like sort of to delegate this to my student uh, or postdoc a student has also disappeared yes yeah, so okay so i will be talking about uh, uh, inferring early universe from observed cosmological perturbations i looked at the talk i gave last year last year i sketched out a few research programs that i work on so basically what am i you know what did i 
start thinking when I was a faculty, you know, when I came in as a faculty. Uh, one thing is, you know, I tend to plan very long in advance. So I realized that the game of, you know, pinpointing the cosmological model was already well developed and the, the entire mainstream would really focus on that. But what is very important to realize that all the success there relies on some fundamental assumptions. I think last time I focused on one of them, which is that the universe is homogeneous and isotropic. Okay. And this time, uh, I just wanted to highlight the fact that we are talking about a very successful cosmological model standing on essentially you know, stand, it's not, you know, rock, you know, and it could be a quicksand, right? So we base our entire inference about cosmology on things uh, that uh, yet are yet to be, you know, really nailed, and we should be working towards that, okay? And so this is one such area, and uh, let me first review the success, and I will focus on one particular cosmological observation, which, um, you know, I think arguably has been the most influential in, uh, you know, changing the perception about cosmology from being a branch of metaphysics to, you know, actually a uh, real science. So the story starts with, uh, you know, we sitting here and peering out uh, like many of these people do and for prime example stand sitting right in front of me. And as you look further and further away, you're looking at a universe in the past. So if you go 14 gigaparsecs away, then you hit a plasma wall. This is true for every observer. And so this plasma wall was discovered in 1965. And if you believed in hot Big Bang theory, this was essentially uh, you know, a thermal background and which was very spectacularly confirmed by an experiment in 1991. This was the year that I, you know, basically started my research. And then the same experiment also started seeing some features on it, okay? And it's not as if this background was discovered in 1965 and people believed it was thermal, but it was, you know, a, a black body, but, you know, that was more theoretically motivated than, you know, observationally absolutely verified. I mean, you know, this is confirmed to a amazing accuracy. I won't get into that. Okay. Now, why is this so important? Because this stands like a, you know, this theater, it's like a cosmic screen. So it divides two parts of the universe. One is that the fluctuations that you're seeing on this screen, you know, it's actually a plasma screen. Okay. So it reflects something that is happening in the early universe, okay? And I'm actually not wrong in saying it's just, you know, vague thing like something, because it is to that extent that we understand it. Something that's happening, we believe it creates density waves in the plasma, and that's what we are seeing as uh, fluctuations in this background. It's just an amazingly smooth background. It's uh, at about three Kelvin up to 10 parts per million, okay? So it required 25 years to get to the things that, uh, you know, that there are fluctuations here. Okay, and why is it so important? Because these fluctuations need to exist in an homogeneous universe. So the background cosmology is built on the assumption that the universe is homogeneous isotropic. But we, you know, you look out at the cosmos and you see it's not true. I mean, there are galaxies, there are galaxies are organized in huge clusters, clusters are, have chains of filaments. So there are people working on that and this whole story goes on like that. So this is the large scale structure that we see now. It's a very rich organized structure in the distribution of matter. And this is always believed that gravitational instability was enough if there were tiny enough fluctuations in the early universe to grow them just due to gravitational instability to give you this structure. And that's what the cosmic micro background observation started, you know, uh, becoming important because it connects two sites. I mean, you have a universe which you see, which is early when it was only half a million years old, you know, connecting to a 14 billion years old universe now. And then you have an isotropy and uh, polarization information on it. 
So, yeah, I talked about the temperature fluctuations, but what is amazing is that if you look at the microwave background and with a polarized sheet, the intensity is maximum at a particular angle and then you can draw a stick. So, you basically have a headless vector field on a sphere and as we do in physics, so anything wherever you see a vector field, you decompose it into a gradient part and a curl part. So, you can do that on a sphere and uh, so, this is the fluctuation of the intensity at about 70 micro kelvins on a 3 kelvin background and then there are these curl part and the you know potential for the uh, curl part and this is the potential for the gradient part. These are called E and B mode of polarization. It is equivalent way of describing this vector field, right. It is a scalar and a pseudo scalar. So, essentially we have three measurables, uh, six spectra in fact, but four what we really think are important for uh, understanding cosmology, but then you know we do not know physics can surprise us. So, if there are parity violations issues. Uh, then you will get these. Of course, again people who are in the game know that you will first worry about whether your instrument is working fine. So, you are more worried whether the you know this parity violating signal comes from anything which is uh, you know in your instrument. And I should also tell you that when we say there is no parity violation, these are the things. If you want to establish that there is parity violation, the bar is very high. You know we have a fairly understood cosmology. So, even Einstein when he went and tried to say GR is the right thing, you should read the history of how many people tried to say oh no, no the perihelion shift can be this, that you know. So, you do not really give up something very hard. So, the bar is very high, but again the observations are equally good. So, we have had three decades of very successful observations and it still goes on. So, and just to tell you how much a field can influence. So, I started here as a PhD student okay? and this number here is something called the figure of merit. It is essentially inverse of the volume, I was the showing you the inverse of the volume of uncertainty in your cosmological understanding of the cosmological parameters. So, this is about less than 10. And at this point depending on where you want to be on this, I would not get into the details, but from a billion to uh, 10 to a 15, you know is the enhancement in our understanding of cosmology one single thing. So, it is three times faster than Moore's law. Okay. Uh, this is a picture from Planck, you know when it final released they sort of encapsulated you know how important that was. And so, that resulted in an understanding where I do not want you to look at these numbers, but these are basically the numbers by which we describe the current cosmology. And they are known now to you know percent and sub percent level. You know I think for many of you in other fields it may not be a surprise, okay. but when I started in this field, this number was known to a factor of 2 observationally, people fought to death over it. And I mean we never thought we will get to such numbers you know look at this right. This is kind of plasma uh, has waves and this tells you how far the wave has traveled in the lifetime of the universe till then okay. And we know it till to this accuracy four orders of magnitude right. I mean it is unbelievable okay. And so, this again is another depiction of uh, you know why you need to push on. The error bar is going down, again going down, this is what we are at, right. So, these are various parameters and how over the years with different you know generation of experiments, this is what happens. Uh, this I will skip, but based on the success of course, we really proudly say that we have a standard model of cosmology. Uh, you see that I have this habit of always putting a quote because people should realize and I found that in talking to particle physicists, this standard part is a bit different from when particle physicists say we have a standard model okay? and it has to be appreciated a little better. Okay? 
uh, I again people can talk to me later about it. So then you should really question, you know, we've got all this success, does it, you know, ha, ha, is every element of that checked out? I sort of skipped a slide here, I think missed it. But there are many of such things that have been happening. So, you know, by the end of the, you know, at the start of the last millennium, it was fairly clear that cosmology was in good hands. I mean, you know, we were going to get to this parameter. And people started also using the observations to question, do we have any surprises, you know, about it. So one very rich area is the fact that we don't really know what gave rise to this perturbation in the first place. We have a guess. So, this is the success uh, story of cosmology now to connect these fluctuations you see in the cosmic string uh, screen to uh, the universe now, okay. And that has actually is, is primarily what gives you all this. But we still have to understand this and we have a guess. We believe that if you do quantum field theory on curved space time, uh, which you know gives you Hawking radiation and all these things. So, if you believe all that and you apply it to a universe which is expanding in an accelerated fashion very rapidly, that is called inflation, then a simple calculation there, I mean it looks simple to me now, but you know when uh, these were done obviously in 82 and all, these were you know remarkable things. But uh, you will find that, uh, sorry you will generate quantum fluctuations which are at enormous wavelengths and then again it is not a sorted out theory, but uh, these quantum fluctuations, uh, they are very arguments, heuristic arguments or you know very convincing arguments, but not a proof that these classical uh, quantum fluctuations become classical, okay. And then we get the density perturbations that we see not only density perturbations, what is very important to realize is this mechanism has some, you know, everything has something that, you know, gives it away, right. The specific thing about this mechanism is when it creates density waves, the same mechanism must create gravitational waves. There is no way to escape it. Now, you can have a model where the gravitational wave amplitudes relative to the density waves is low, but it is a testable hypothesis. Right, and that's why that's the you know target for particularly the you know field that I am working on, uh, and it's based on a very simple idea. Okay, so it's, it was something that Linde actually brought her, Andre Linde, and it, you know it's a very complicated field. It's a zoo of models. I won't, know. but at the heart of it is a very simple phenomena. So you have, for some reasons, a scalar field. Uh, displaced from its true minima, okay. Now there are, I won't get into why, how, but if you can arrange for that, then inflation, this epoch happens by magic. I mean not magic, but you know, of course equations, but it's remarkable that it happens. So you will find that, okay, let me not get into it, but uh, this will create a universe that has accelerated expansion, right. So, you know, so, this deceleration parameter which was something that people talked about is actually uh, negative for this. And what you need is this should be displaced from the minima sufficiently, okay. Every model of inflation uh, actually can be cast back to this, okay. Ev I mean, okay, uh, I should not say every, but as far as I know every model uh, can be cast into this. So, now you want to know why did this fluctuations come. So, a field, this is like a ball, but a field rolling down, okay. As it rolls down, it is a, okay, also I should mention, what happens here is when the field is displaced, uh, you know, uh, basically there is a huge Hubble constant, which is, acts like a oh, drag, okay. And then, it gives you fluctuations because as the field loads down classically, they are quantum jitters and this jitters mean the different areas, different regions of the universe have this history, but the, if you look at the quantum fluctuations, then the history is slightly different. And so the universe somehow 
you know, if you look at the cosmic clock, and some at the end of inflation, some you know, part of the universe is slightly ahead in time and back in time, and that is enough to create the density perturbation that you see. So, I, I mean, I just want to flash this to say that this can be cast in a very simple quantum mechanics problem. Many undergraduates have worked with me on this, and because it is so well understood, you can connect uh, the power spectrum to the kind of uh, inflationary potential that you get. So, for people in the field, you know, a lo lot of times people are telling you the current observations tell you that the inflaton potential has to be like this, not like this. Okay? And that is largely because of the limit that we have put on the gravity wave amplitude. Okay? So, you know, this is long back, there was this uh, master student who worked out something and there are various ways to connect it. So, let me just tell you that the early universe is fairly well understood, you know, in the uh, from something like, you know, the statement, the party statement is we do see a spatially flat universe, nearly scale invariant and this thing and then, you know, so we seem to be very consistent with inflation except for that gravitational wave amplitude. So, let me do this. Now, what have we been doing? We have been looking whether there are uh, certain surprises. So, what is worrisome about this is we seem to believe in a model and fit it to data, right? So, which means that I cannot anticipate anything which is unexpected in my model, right? So, we turned this story around and we said now we have a great data. So, you can start asking is there anything more beyond this thing? So, this is something that Arman Shafilu as a student did and there is a whole thing which is still ongoing. So, when we looked at the WMAP data, we did see instead of a really featureless power spectrum, you know, a power spectrum like this is favored. But, you know, so if there is a early universe model or some physics which can give you these features, you will get it and there are many, many ways you can get such features in, you know, this thing. Uh, Here is a whole bunch of features that were compared uh, to WMAP data long back. And then there is this line of work which uh, Raghu, Raghavendra is probably around, his uh, group has continued beyond that, where you have, you know, you play around with the model and see if you can get these features, okay. And they really help uh, match to the, uh, you know, cosmologies. And this is important because the cosmology that you will derive if you allow for these features in the power spectrum will be very different, could be very different. Okay? And this is something that we started talking about in 2008. We showed that you know, the reason we think our estimates are very robust is because very closely, close to the you know, best fit cosmology, you find that if you move around a little bit, nothing happens. But if you really change the power spectrum dramatically, you can get cosmology which is very different. This is a distance in the cosmological model and you can see that you know you can have much better fit to the data very far away. So, it could be that we are fooled. We think this is our cosmology, this is our omega baryon, this is this, but what is happening is you know some physics tells you there is a feature in the power spectrum and you know your cosmology is very different. So, I feel that this is a big loophole, right? So, our cosmological understanding is completely, you know, uh, predicated or, you know, it, it comes automatically out of this assumption, right? And uh, also, there are certain things we could also do because it influences the cosmological parameters. We had this nice result where, you know, people asked about whether da dark energy or this cosmological constant exists or not. Okay. What we could show is you can play around with the power spectrum as much as you like. You cannot fit a model which does not have dark energy to the cosmic micro background. Okay. And I think that is a very powerful statement. We ruled it out at 4 sigma and I am sorry, I am going over time. But then, you know, you keep doing it as the data improves and so, you know, there have been students and their postdocs and things going on. I will just tell you that, you know, for example, you are talking about the Hubble tension, right? The value from 
a local universe is different from what you derive from cosmology. So, you can say okay, can I find a power spectrum that matches Drew? So, you can go ahead. So, this is the power spectrum you need to have the same cosmology, but the H naught is different. Okay? And then I would not really get into that, but what is important is this projection of the primordial power spectrum on your cosmological parameters. So, you are kind of you can you know your inference of the cosmological parameters completely depends on what you put. Now, I, I would stop at that saying that you know look this is too complicated a power spectrum to bring in to explain this H naught thing, but it does work I mean so this is obviously I was part of the paper. So, you know and this is continued with I am not here, but uh, Deepak uh, uh, Dheeraj Hazra and our man have a recent paper where basically it is a nice cure them all. So, there are various tensions in cosmology and what they show is a very simple feature like this simple that is their feeling it is a simple feature and you can get it if you change your potential to this inflate on potential to this you get this blue curve which uh, will solve all your problems. Okay. So, to me it just to tells you how weak the ground on which we stand. Okay. So, what will really resolve this is a measurement of the gravitational waves and uh, it is a to do must do and as I said there is the last time there is the Indian effort and I, I think this is vital right because that is the one I, I, I could not really spend time on the first uh, project that Jeremy did is that is where we showed that you know how sensitive is your inference on the gravitational wave background. I am sorry I have gone quite a bit over time. Thank you. Couple of quick questions. The parity violation, um, what does it uh, signify? I mean, what does it signify about Einstein theory? Uh, is it uh, things that are uh, to do with, uh, uh, you know, these, uh, uh, tet not tetrad, but I'm, I'm missing. Yeah, three okay. form fields. Yeah, okay, the extra three form fields yeah, which so there, are, there are people who can. So, who in their theory have this three form field you know mm -hmm. who they are yeah, yeah. and uh, so there can be such fields I mean there exist in their theory such fields you can imagine that to be coupled to electromagnetic field with a coupling. If you have such a thing mm -hmm. then as the photon propagates uh, the polarization rotates mm. and you can create. But you have to you have to also explain why you do not see them in your lab right. You, you see field. them in your lab. Why you do not see such three form fields yeah, in your so lab? Okay. So, that is why you know, but uh, eventually you will have to yes. So, a doubt. Uh, so, you talked at one point about the gravitational wave connecting with the density waves in the early universe. So, this is an energy density fluctuation uh, means this is what you are connecting? Yeah. So, the okay. <coughs> Yeah, I mean energy density in the sense gravitational waves carry energy which you know no. uh, interestingly in 1959 finally physicists agreed that it does uh, they are real. Um, so, it is yes. So, no, but my doubt fluctuation, is that I mean and yeah. density fluctuations are essentially I told you the what is generated is a universe which is slightly ahead and backward in time, mm -hmm. but because GR is covariant you know that translates to density perturbations if you do a different slicing. You can call it anything you like. I mean, the, you know, GR is amazing that way. Yeah. So and yeah, so it is density. It's in actually energy fluctuations. Yes, if you want to. Yes. I mean, I, I still don't and get the also connection. Also, the density. Yeah. I mean, the gravitational waves are gravitational waves in terms of you know they carry. Yeah. But I'll ask later. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, sir. Nice talk. I want to know about uh, see the CMB based. Uh, gravitational wave direction uh, in, this, in the in gravitational wave uh, spectrum it is uh, very much low frequency uh, direction. So, uh, that uh, that wave period itself it is it is long. So, how how uh, it so is tackled tackle here in this EMB based curve. question yes. So, these are waves uh, at very low frequency the time period is the age of the universe. So, you do not see them changing right what you see is a frozen stress field strain field sorry okay so what happens is the plasma surface that you have i showed you a beautiful sphere it is a beautiful sphere it's slightly distorted 
uh, due to this density fluctuations. But if there is a long wavelength gravitational field, it creates a distortion, which is pretty distinct uh, when it comes to the gradient part of the polarization that you measure. Okay. Uh, so you you don't see it changing. Okay. It's a fixed pattern because the wavelength. I mean, the time period is uh, wavelength is large. The time period is large. Oh, okay. thanks. And uh, by the way, in few months' time, hopefully you will see another cousin of this, where the you will be talking about detection of gravitational waves, uh, which have a period of years. So essentially, you also don't see them really, you know, going past like an oscillation. Uh, but yeah, they are at least you know in a lifetime you can see things change. Let's thank the okay. once again. Uh, you. And uh, moving on to the next talk by Sonali Sachdeva talking about the science of galaxy formation using JWST. Thank you for not leaving after Tarun's talk. Uh, the problem with the prime slot is that you see people leaving before your talk. So I hope I justify uh, the time you spent here in this talk. Uh, my topic is uh, science of galaxy formation and what I would like to tell you, uh, uh, what I would focus on is uh, why billions of dollars, two decades of human endeavor, why so much of time, so much of energy, so much of uh, manpower was spent into putting uh, JWST like instruments in space, how it helps in our endeavor uh, to to understand how universe formed, how the first galaxies formed, and how we have reached the present uh, present universe, the present galaxies that we see now. Uh, so, uh, why to uh, embark on that, to continue with that, we need instruments like these. Uh, so, that is what I would like to convey, and I hope you get some aspects of that uh, during this talk. So, I would begin with uh, with the local galaxies, the galaxies that we see here, that we see now, uh, they are very well defined. They have, uh, the stars are either confined to a disk in a rotational motion, uh, like, like Milky Way, or they are uh, in a elliptical like uh, galaxy, like they are, the stars are main, uh, mainly, the dominated motion is the velocity dispersion. So, uh, with these galaxies that you see, more than 97% of the galaxies that you see now can easily be placed in what is called the Hubble tuning fork diagram, the Hubble diagram for galaxies. So, uh, how dominant are their spiral arms, how, uh, whether they have a bar or not, how elliptical is it, uh, how, um, uh, what is the shape. But, so, based on that, you can put all the galaxies that you see now into these uh, fine refined categories. But as you move to uh, higher redshift uh, to when, when the universe was younger, uh, for example, this is uh, redshift 0.6, 2.7. So this is half the age of the universe. So you can see that they are less well defined. There are, they, uh, there are more irregular structures. They are, they are clumpy. They, uh, so, uh, you get a sense that this is a, 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 an earlier age of, uh, of what we see now. So how galaxies have grown from that stage to this stage. And then as we move to even higher redshift, this is like redshift 1.6, uh, 1.7, 2, 3. So this is when the universe was 3 giga years old, 4 giga years old. So then, even, then uh, we are not able to see any refined structures only when we uh, fit their light profiles, we are able to see that, oh, maybe a disk exists, there's an exponential profile, maybe there's a bulge and this, and those kind of features come out when you do more, more analysis, but you can see that, uh, so what that gives you an understanding, a very nascent understanding, is that you are seeing population at various snapshots. So it's like if you see a human population grow, you see kids, you see adolescents, and then you have to connect that uh, who becomes what. So uh, how we have see how we see the ellipticals and the spirals from which galaxies have they grown to this stage? What have been the physical me mechanisms? What have been the processes? So that is uh, one thing that comes into your mind. You can see that they have 
uh, grown in size, they have grown in mass, but what have been the, uh, the processes through which this kind of transition has happened. Uh, and uh, so let me tell you that this, even this kind of progress, I haven't shown you any JWST images till now, even this kind of progress became possible in the last decade. Uh, uh, Hubble Space Telescope was commissioned with a new instrument in 2009, and that made it possible for the first time to see even redshift more than one galaxies uh, in, uh, in optical. Redshift more than one means when the universe was six, seven giga years old. So, uh, so the progress has been very lately, and uh, and now, uh, now let me tell you what are the two problems that uh, two things that we face as we move to higher redshift. One thing actually is uh, saves us, and one thing uh, we need to overcome. So, for that, I would like to tell you that uh, when when we, uh, because of the cosmological expansion. The, there are different distances uh, as to how far a galaxy is. There are different distances. And uh, so, so, for example, uh, luminosity distance, we all understand that how much time light has taken to reach us. And then there's this angular diameter distance. What to, so, uh, this is the angle, this is the distance. But because there's a cosmological expansion, these distances are not same. And also, Surface brightness, which is supposed to be intrinsic, which is supposed, which is uh, not supposed to change from, uh, with distance, it does change. It goes. We see a surface brightness dimming, so uh, the uh, the objects become less bright just because uh, the, just because of cosmology, just because there's an expansion. You can recall that flux is. Uh, uh, luminosity upon 4 pi, uh, the distance square, and area is like this. So when you do intensity, you do flux upon uh, upon the uh, solid angle. And then if dl and dA were same, then this would have been L 4 pi A, which would remain constant. But what happens is that uh, we go through a 1 upon uh, 1 plus z to the power 4 kind of dimming. So even if you take the same galaxy and you put it at redshift 1, it would be 1 16th bright than what is it now. So that is purely because the universe is expanding. And so we have to counter that. We have to go deeper and we have to build telescopes that have larger collecting area that are able to uh, go fainter and fainter, collect more photons, and are able to go deeper. So that's why you can see that uh, the, the telescopes, that the future, this is JWST, it is here. Uh, how the main idea is that it is able to probe even deeper, it is able to go to even fainter magnitudes, uh, luminosities, right? So, uh, and of course, what it also helps you in that is, is that the resolution also improves. But one thing that uh, in which cosmology helps us is that the angular resolution doesn't go that kind of uh, surface brightness, what surface brightness goes through dimming. But angular resolution basically remains more or less the same. What I'm trying to say is, suppose there's a five kiloparsec galaxy. It takes five arc seconds in the sky uh, at redshift one. It would, uh, even at redshift 10, it would take five arc seconds. So that goes in our favor that, okay, we don't have to, uh, but what pro the problem is that galaxies were smaller when they were younger. So anyway, you need to resolve better if you want to see younger galaxies, if you want to see uh, uh, earlier galaxies. Okay. So now these are JWST images, and they are in different filters. And uh, so this, these galaxies are, this is the same galaxy in different filters. This is same galaxy in different filters. and. Uh, how do you know that this galaxy is, is from when the universe was less than one giga years old? Today, uh, the age is 14 giga years. So this is, how do you know that? This is something that we know from the uh, photometric, the dropout technique. Means the galaxy is visible in this filter, in the redder filters, but it disappears in this filter. So uh, when a galaxy is further away, then its, uh, its spectrum gets red shifted. So as red shifted it is, uh, it tells you that uh, what has be, what is the uh, 
uh, redshift of the galaxy, how far it is that it is not visible in this filter, not in this filter, uh, more visible in this filter. So that kind of gives you a, uh, a first hand idea of how far the galaxy is. So uh, uh, a very standard technique that is used is the Lyman break technique. Uh, all the wavelengths that are smaller than uh, some 1200 angstrom, they uh, interact with the neutral hydrogen, they uh, excite it, ionize it, and so we, we don't see them. And that is supposed to happen at like 0.1 micron, but here the drop happens at 1 micron. So that tells you that, okay, this is a redshift 7 galaxy because the dropout has been shifted. So this, where the drop happens, that, uh, so this is the Lyman break technique through which uh, high redshift galaxies are, uh, are told to be, or are known to be, okay, this is this redshift, this is this redshift. The other more important thing is that you fit the spectra. So here you can see these red points are the fluxes that you have got in various filters. These are four galaxies. Now, when you have these uh, fluxes in different filters, different wavelengths for a given galaxy. What you do is that you fit a spectrum. Now these spectrums have been created by, uh, by amazing softwares that take a huge range of initial mass function, star formation rates, stellar mass, so all kinds of parameters and they generate thousands of thousands of spectra. Then you fit your spectra with, with those spectra and then you redshift and then you try to find which redshift, which redshift fits it better. For example, here you can see blue is redshift 9, green is redshift 3. And from this uh, reduced chi-square from what is the better fit, you say that, okay, redshift 9 seems to be much more probable than redshift 3. So through this, you try to, uh, th this is another technique, uh, spectral fitting, through which you try to see which spectra fits better best. So how far the galaxy is, what is the redshift of the galaxy. Now when you have a sample, when you have a good sample, you have seen a lot of galaxies at different redshift. What you are able to see, what you are able to do is uh, make these kind of plots and they give you a lot of information. For example, this is, uh, the, this is the number of galaxies in each mass bin at a given redshift. So for example, this is redshift 5, the number of galaxies in each redshift, in each mass bin that, that, are de that is detected. So when you plot it for different redshift ranges, it gives you an idea that there's a, there's a mass increase or not. What we see is that yes, there's a mass increase and that gives uh, evidence for hierarchical structure formation. So uh, then the other thing, uh, whether, what is the size for a particular luminosity of galaxies? what is the size distribution of galaxies uh, when we have a particular luminosity bin. So has that changed with, uh, has that changed with redshift. So that also we see that the size has increased and the mass has increased. So these are the few preliminary things that we can see that okay, galaxies have definitely grown in mass, grown in size. Then comes the details that uh, what kind of galaxies formed, how they, uh, how they grew, for example, one clear evidence that comes when we do the study of galaxies at this, uh, at, in the local universe is that uh, we can see that the uh, galaxies that are classified differently in terms of structure, for example, it's a disk-like galaxy or a, or a elliptical-like galaxy, they seem to have different evolutionary pathways. So uh, once you are able to classify galaxies according to their structure, they also tell you about how their star formation would have evolved, how their mass would have evolved, what kind of processes they would have faced. So that kind of things, uh, those kind of things also can be done later when you have better resolution, when you have more details. But at least this kind of thing that how mass has increased, how size has increased, that can be done. And for that you need larger and larger samples at each, each redshift and that only happens when you scan larger areas of the sky and when you do it with better and better telescopes that have more depth and more resolution and also which are able to see in the infrared because optical light is going to get redshifted to the infrared so you want to see in the infrared. Then another thing how the star formation is evolving which I would skip because I just have two minutes and I would uh, and with this, uh, this galaxy, which, uh, so there are, 
lot of galaxies that are getting detected at very high redshift means when the universe was just 240 giga years old and this is a this is quite a massive galaxy uh, 10 to the power 9 solar mass so if this galaxy was present today we would say that it is uh, it is 4 to 5 sorry sorry this should be mega years so, uh, so uh, when the universe was just 240 mega years old and if you uh, see such a galaxy today you will say that oh it is at least 4 to 5 giga years old but that kind of time universe doesn't have at that moment so when did this galaxy form you know for so the uh, somehow explanation is that okay maybe we need star formation efficiency 100 percent but what we see on average is star formation efficiency less than 2 percent so these kind of galaxies are actually questioning that uh, when did the dark ages happen, when did the reionization happen and so they are actually bringing a challenge to but still we need uh, better samples, we need more samples, we need uh, higher resolution, more depth etc etc and uh, spectroscopic confirmation. So I, I end with uh, this slide, thank you. Thanks Sonali. Uh, questions? So, for example, uh, <clears throat> sometimes there are there are two breaks, like uh, Balmer break and uh, like Lyman break, and based on that, we are saying that uh, this is the uh, like uh, redshift because we know what at what it the break should happen. Like for example, here we can see only one break. So, how are we sure that this is the Lyman break and not the Balmer break? So, uh, this is not the only uh, way. This is not the only just fitting the spectrum, but also where the photometric dropout happens. And also like whether the galaxy is resolved and which gives a better fit in terms of when you fit the spectra, which, uh, which redshift of the, which uh, redshift spectrum gives the better fit, then we need, then uh, more galaxies. If we have more galaxies only then we are, if there is just this one candidate, then of course it will be ruled out that no, no, this, uh, this, the, this may have been an aberration, may have been something else. But when you see a lot of galaxies and all the evidence adds to that, yes, this is a high redshift galaxy, that is when uh, there is enough proof and you can say. And also at the beginning you said that uh, this, uh, th that old galaxies have less morphology. Yes, old, older galaxies have less morphological features like yes. for example disk, uh, lack of disk and all. So this is, uh, is it because we can't resolve it or is it because we can, we can resolve it, somewhat resolve it and after that we are saying that it, it lacks morphology? So as I said, the resolution doesn't suffer much. It will still take 5 arc seconds. So but yes, we need to even resolve better. We need to see if there are more features. But this is mainly because the galaxies were smaller and then uh, they, they didn't have those kind of features. I mean, we don't see like spiral arms, etc., bars. Those are more of a uh, later age uh, universe features. So yes, so that you can say that maybe they have developed later on. In the left corner of the email. No, no. This, you know, even I tried to read, I didn't find it. I don't understand. This is from some paper. I don't know what this means. GHZ. This taken JWST images? Yeah, these are JWST. Any other questions? Uh, I have a quick one. When you're doing the SED fitting where you have, say, two red shifts and you have shown the differences between them, what decides these emission features uh, and why are they very different for the two red shifts? So these are just some two spectra that have been created with a large number of initial parameters like initial mass function, star formation rate, stellar mass, all kinds of like what kind of stellar populations are there, etc. And then they have been red shifted and seen like thousands of uh, spectra and seen which ones fits best. So that could have any amount or any number of features. The main thing is that the overall thing fits with what you are observing. So the model parameters that has changed is not the redshift but everything else as well? Yes, yes. Uh, any last questions? Um, if not, let's thank Sonali once again. <laughs> and we'll switch gears. Uh, and now uh, next speaker is Saurabh Kaushik talking about measurement of cellular stiffness for diagnostic applications. Thank you. Thank you for the talk and uh, good morning everyone. Uh, I'll be presenting my work on uh, measurement of cellular stiffnesses 
uh, using a homemade, lab-made electrophilic uh, device. And then also we'll measure those same cells in the same conditions using uh, atomic force microscopy. Uh, so basically, uh, these uh, biological systems, these cells are extremely complicated in nature and uh, uh, to study them as a whole is uh, not very easy. So uh, there are different uh, controlling parameters or uh, mechanics which involves uh, cell study. So it could be crowding different uh, forces acting on it, uh, its shape and deformability, uh, charges in it and the surrounding charges and its active and passive mo motion. So uh, in my work, I'm only going to uh, focus on the shape, the physiology of the cell, and the deformability, the stiffness of the cells. Uh, and why it is important, uh, how does it play a role in uh, diagnostic applications is what I'm going to talk about in this talk. So uh, basically, uh, the cells, they have different, uh, different properties. And as we can see that uh, in humans, we start from a sperm and then all the way till uh, this uh, stem cells. Uh, the journey is exactly the same and after these stem cells is what different uh, cells in our body are uh, created. There are studies which shows that uh, the same cells when they are been introduced to different mechanical environment, uh, they uh, take different pathways. They become uh, red blood cells, neuron muscle cells and different, different types of cells have been formed just from the stem cells. Only thing that changes is uh, their mechanical environment in which they are presently. Uh, for example, this mechanics, the stiffness and elasticity, what I'm going to study in this uh, entire study, uh, is important as uh, we can see that uh, for cancer cells, the way they metastasize is uh, normal cells, they have this pathway of going through different places, but cancer cells, they, they spread from one organ to different organ. So basically at different stages of this metastatic state of these uh, cancer cells, uh, these cells, uh, when a cell uh, is uh, infected in by, by these uh, cancer, uh, uh, is in a cancer state, uh, they become a little bit softer. And that is how they go to places where they're not allowed to. They go through these orifices or these meshes where normally these cells are not allowed to go. So just these cancer cell becomes softer and that is why it's, it metastasizes from one place to other. And that is when we say that, okay, this patient is at stage one, stage two, stage three, and so on. Uh, similarly, uh, in the, the different vessels, blood vessels that we have, uh, there are these uh, channels through which these cells flow, red blood cells basically. And I'll also talk about one of the genetic disorder, uh, sickle cell anemia at the end of this uh, talk. Uh, these cells, when they go through the, the elasticity, the stiffness of the cell plays a major role, uh, how uh, nicely that these, uh, these cells can pass through. And uh, that plays an important role uh, in these genetic disorder uh, based diseases. So basically, uh, first of all, in this one slide, I'm going to give the summary of uh, the talk that I've given uh, last year. So as I've told, I will be talking about the physiology of the cell and the mechanics of the cell. And this, uh, uh, this is the setup uh, schematic where I have uh, these uh, model cells of different sizes. And they give this electro, uh, electrofluidic uh, uh, signals. If the cell is bigger, it gives a larger signal. If it's smaller, it gives a smaller signal. And then these can be mapped to uh, using model to get the actual volumes of the cell. So uh, we have uh, this electrophilic uh, device which can detect volume changes, not just volume, but volume changes of the order of 0.6 femtoliters. And uh, here in this work, we have shown that uh, from our device, we can detect uh, uh, the changes caused in the, uh, in the cells when it has been introduced to ethanol, which cannot be detected using normal uh, imaging techniques. As you can see the comparison, that the same orders of magnitude of uh, uh, ethanol concentration was imparted to these cells and uh, during the uh, topography imaging uh, technique, these cells are not, uh, no changes in the cellular volume is detected. So uh, this is uh, something about the cellular volume detection. We have also made a homemade uh, electronics uh, which costs around 1, 000, uh, 100 times cheaper than what is uh, existing um, uh, amplifier that we have. For example, in the, the um, the combustion amplifier that we use for these detection, detection, detection methods uh, costs somewhere around 0.5 million, uh, million INR, but we have made it in 3500, uh, 3500 INR. So that is a way that we can actually use these uh, cheaper electronics and giving it almost exactly the same uh, signals and take these to uh, different places in hospitals or rural areas to do the uh, diagnostic applications of our technique. So basically the second part of this was that previous slide was from the last year what I have done. So this year what I have done is uh, the same technique 
but uh, these orifice of the device is uh, smaller than the cell size and when the cell goes through it if it is a stiff cell it is going to give a longer uh, delta t the dwell time is going to be longer and if a uh, softer cell goes through then the, these values are going to be smaller based on just these dt's we can uh, uh, detect the uh, cells with the diff populations of uh, cells which are stiffer and softer and uh, uh, then, then uh, this is the uh, device fabrication for uh, this experiment. Uh, you can see images of these five different pores that I have used uh, in uh, this study. And uh, there are the numbers, the uh, pore length uh, and uh, pore diameter. And uh, you can just see the video how uh, these pores are being made. Uh, so we use uh, this shape of filament to heat it uh, to get the desired uh, dimensions of what we need. And then uh, we use fire polishing to just uh, close the front region of this uh, device. These are made from a glass capillary. Uh, all right, so these are the uh, data from uh, these five different uh, devices of different uh, pore diameters. Uh, so basically what we do is, uh, normally we have these uh, red blood cells, they have some specific elasticity. So in order to uh, calibrate the system and to understand if uh, our device is actually prone to give these signals, any change in the elasticity, what we do is we use a drug, electrocolin A. What it does is uh, it, uh, it inhibits the uh, polymerization rate of the uh, of the actins uh, in present in the uh, cells. These actins are actually part of the skeleton of the red blood cells. So it basically uh, uh, stops the regeneration of these actins. Uh, inhibits rate of regeneration of these actins because of which the skeleton become, becomes weak because of which the cells uh, ultimately becomes little bit softer. So as it has been introduced, the cells have been introduced to different concentrations of this uh, drug, you can see the delta T measurement from our device keeps on decreasing. And uh, here you can see the histogram of uh, those uh, events. So just to make sure that uh, this delta T decrease we, that we are getting from our device is only purely because of the change in the stiffness. So it is possible that uh, the cell size is smaller. So just to make sure that the, the size of the cell is not changing. Because previously we have shown just when the RBCs are introduced to ethanol, their size decreases. Just to make sure that the same uh, free flight experiment where the device is, uh, the diameter dimensions are bigger than the, uh, the sample size. Uh, we use one of these pores of 8.5 micron uh, diameter and we see that the relative uh, change in volume uh, is almost same for all of these. So though there is no dramatic change in the, um, there is no dramatic change in the size. So these, these signals in the previous slide, whatever we get is purely because there is a change in the mechanics of the cell when introduced to these drugs. So uh, that was the done, that, that whole thing was done using the homemade uh, electrofluidic device. Now just to make sure that whatever measurement we are getting, delta T is not a parameter to be uh, say, okay, delta T is what the mechanics of the, the elasticity of the cell is. To map it to the actual physical numbers giving the stiffness of the cell, we do this uh, four, spectroscopy, four spectroscopy measurements using uh, atomic force uh, microscope. And you can see this, uh, that uh, the stiffer uh, cells will give a uh, signal like this and the softer cells give signal like this. And we use a Hertz uh, parabolic model to, mo uh, to get the elastic values. And uh, these are the parameters of the cantilever that we have used. So uh, here you can see that uh, for these five, exactly the same concentration, same, same conditions that we have used in the micropore device, uh, these, this is, uh, these are just one uh, FX curve taken from each of these samples. And we see for uh, like these number of cells, uh, this is the population uh, of the, the statistics of uh, the uh, elasticity measurement measured from the four spectroscopy measurement. And this is the mean value. Uh, you can see that uh, there is a decrease in the elasticity as expected when the cell has been introduced with the latte drug. So here you can see a comparison of the signals from the micropore device, our electrofluidic device, and the AFM showing the effect of latte. So you can see that uh, the native one, the one cells which are not been uh, introduced with the latte drug, uh, gives a larger signal. And uh, as you keep on increasing the concentration of the latte drug, uh, the signal's width keeps on decreasing. Exactly the same thing you can see. Uh, the the cells, when uh, uh, treated with the AFM, uh, the four spectroscopy has been done. Uh, the st steepness of this uh, native cells is more, and the steepness of the uh, the highest concentrated uh, latte drug is less. So uh, now, what we do is we normalize these values. Uh, 
nor normalize uh, these these dt values uh, and the afm measured values and uh, f with the normalization has been done with the data at the natives native value so whatever is the delta t uh, measured from the device for native with that as a reference the data has been normalized and we can see uh, these two afm measurements and the electrophilic measurements are completely different setups but when they are been normalized with their native condition uh, they follow almost exactly the same trend which shows that the measurements that we have done from our electrophilic device can directly be mapped to the uh, actual uh, stiffness of the cell so uh, here is a uh, one of the poses that I have shown that uh, I have uh, I am trying to map the elasticity with the delta t measurements of our device, and we can see there is a linear dependency. So we do it for all the different five poses that we have done, and we uh, we get uh, con almost a constant slope of 1.5 uh, times uh, uh, 1.5, uh, which says that if we have made our electrophilic device with the way I have made a specific protocol. Uh, the cutting, shrinking, and uh, fire polishing. Uh, if they are made with a specific protocol, then the elasticity can be mapped directly to the delta T measurements that have been done using those devices. So there are different parameters involved in the measurements of electrophilic device. Uh, one of them is going to be flow rate. If we increase the flow rate, the delta T is going to change. The, the time it spends in the uh, device is going to change. Uh, also, the pore diameter, if we increase the pore diameter, it might go slower. Uh, and uh, the pore length, the sensing length. So there are three important parameters. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to uh, isolate these parameters and make our device in a way that if we know the exact geometry of our device, then we can straight away map it to the uh, stiffness of the cells. So that is why we are trying to, uh, we did the same, same experiment with different flow rates and all the different uh, conditions on a single pore. And we also tried to see what are the delta T measurements when we get it for the pore diameter. And we see that uh, at least for the pore diameter, there is a constant uh, dependency on, on delta T with the pore diameter. For uh, this uh, flow rate, uh, we need to figure out how we are going to uh, incorporate that in the modeling of delta T. So apart from that, uh, for the diagnostic application, one of the important thing is that we need to also optimize this uh, setup for higher throughput. The same measurements can also be done using imaging and all. Uh, like, uh, for example, sickle cells, uh, sickle cell uh, images you can see and figure out okay how much is the sickling, but it is a very time-consuming process and the throughput is very less. So we also need to have a high throughput. So we, what we do is we, we like all these experiments were done a very very uh, lower throughput. Like for example, around uh, 1.5 uh, uh, 1.5 events per second. But later on, we can in increase the flow rate and we can also increase the concentration of the cells in the fluid chamber that we do the experiment and we can uh, uh, increase the throughput also. So that is the interpretation of the throughput and this is one of the typical uh, 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 trace of the events that we detect at the 20x uh, RBC concentration. The definition of the concentration I have defined here, uh, how we define the concentration and at uh, 20 microliters per minute flow rate. So that was all that I have done so far and now I'm going to talk about the. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the ongoing work. Uh, so basically, you can see that uh, these are the uh, images of uh, uh, patients, uh, like native cells, uh, and three, four patients are having sickle cell anemia. You can see these uh, uh, these uh, cells uh, sickling a little bit. Okay. Now, because of the sickling, sorry, because of the sickling, uh, these cells when they flow through the capillary. Uh, they occludes it and the patient uh, experiences extreme amount of pain because of which uh, like this is a genetic disorder so the the, the patient has to be treated with some uh, some drug uh, i currently don't know that because we are yet to get these uh, samples from st jones hospital from with whom we are uh, collaborating uh, so in images you can see that we just visually the uh, just to see this uh, sickling, it is not very easy. But uh, when we do these experiments using our device, uh, there is a very discrete uh, histogram shift in the native and the, uh, the sickling. So uh, the idea is that we take these samples from patient 
and we do these experiments and then when the patient is treated with the drug which is going to uh, relieve the pain, so we assume that uh, the sickling is going to go away for a specific amount of time. Then after giving the drug to the patient, we again take that sample and we see that how much is the shift in this uh, delta T histogram, which means that uh, we know for a fact that the cells are getting uh, uh, stiffer because of their occluding in the capillary and the pain has been experienced by the patient. And when the drug is imparted to them, uh, then they are not experiencing pain. So definitely the stiffness, the mechanics of the cells is changing because of the flow of these uh, uh, cells are flowing very easily. So that is the plan, but uh, this, this specific is, thing has been uh, waited until we get a clearance for uh, the samples. So we are still in the documentation phase. Uh, then there is another uh, idea of uh, treating uh, the, uh, working with the malaria parasites in uh, red blood cells. So we can see that uh, the black one is the population from uh, the native RBC which are not, we doesn't have uh, malaria parasite. And uh, if 2% uh, malaria parasite is introduced, you can see the blue population and then 20% uh, malaria par uh, parasite in the sample, then we see a very huge, and you can see in uh, x-axis it is not linear, but it's a log scale. So the shift is extremely high, like from uh, ones of seconds to around uh, 1,000 seconds, uh, milliseconds is what uh, we see. And we can see the shape of these different uh, events here also. Uh, and apart from that, uh, we also are interested in uh, seeing the effect of uh, different uh, chemicals. So, for example, if uh, I have already talked in the very first slide that uh, if the RBC has been introduced with the ethanol, if we take alcohol and all, so how it affects the physiology of the cell, but it also affects the stiffness of the cell, how it is important and how can we use it to understand what actually a person uh, in, in an uh, alcoholic abusive state happens to their uh, uh, biology is what uh, interests us. So uh, that is all, like this is not very conclusive, this is just uh, initial phase data, but we'll be working on that. So that will be all, I'll take questions. Nice talk. Thanks. So I was wondering that uh, when you are showing this dual time measurement, uh, which is giving uh, the stiffness, it's fairly small. So now, like uh, depending on how fast the cell is passing, like how fast the deformation is applied. These are all viscoelastic, so the stiffness will also have that effect, right? So, yes. Sir. So basically, uh, okay. Uh, so what you are saying is ex is exactly correct. So in AFM measurements, what we do is we uh, we fix we we are constrained to the linear regime of the Hertz model. So def the cells are viscoelastic, but the Hertz model is there, like. Until the re linear regime, I'll, I'll show you the plots. I have extra plots if I can. Yeah, so here you can see that uh, we fix the measurements until uh, this uh, 50 nano nanometer indentation. Uh, beyond that, the uh, viscous nature also comes into the play. So mm -hmm. for AFM measurements, right now at least, uh, we have only, fit, uh, fit, like we are fitted every, everywhere, but we see that uh, until here, uh, the, f the Hertz model fits very nicely. Uh, it is like the cell, the red blood cell is, has a dimension of uh, 6 to 8 microns and have, have a thickness of outside, the discus thickness is around 1.7 to 2 microns and the central thickness is around 0.7 to 1.2 microns. We are indenting only 50 nanometers. So we are not indenting too much. But what you are saying is in our measurement, mm. uh, the uh, flow, measurement. flow measurement, uh, yes, that is correct. Uh, the delta T measurements actually have the viscoelastic nature, yeah. but uh, see, this system is like extremely complicated. We are just at the initial phase. So right now we are only uh, working on the elastic uh, principles of uh, these measurements, okay. maybe in future uh, ela uh, yeah. viscoelastic. So for that, the exactly same thing, we also have an experiment planned where we want to see the effect of the surface, like in, in these measurements, the effect of surface is also, like I have not included in the ongoing plan because uh, it will too much. So I can explain that thing later on if you yes. Uh, so my suggestion was like uh, based on this AFM measurement, exactly what you said. So can you uh, adjust the flow rate accordingly to get uh, reliable data? Uh, like uh, uh, that might be possible. Yes, actually, you know what? Uh, if if I show you, yeah. So these long. See, the reason that uh, I have worked with these long pore is that I want to have uh, better resolution in the DT measurements. Okay. 
Now, anyways, the flow rate that I have worked is 50 nanoliters per minute. In order to get a better DT resolution and a longer and a flow rate at which it actually goes through it. If I go at lower flow rates, mm. uh, those cells are going to occlude this. They are going to uh, block it. So there is an experimental constraint. So yes, we can go slower and we can also increase the dimension of these channels, but the resolution in the DT is going to be affected. No, mine is a very uh, simple question. So this seems like a very interesting technique and you're kind of developing it in a bottom-up approach. Are you also thinking of patenting yes, this? Yes, ma'am. Uh, we, I have, like, me and Gautam are already, like, last, you asked the same question last time also. Yes, no, we are in, uh, in making of the documents and yes, before publishing this work, uh, we are going to apply for patent. Yeah, last question, sorry, someone. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my question is regarding the AFM things. So you, I think you have used uh, particular task tip. Yes. Uh, but uh, if I'm not wrong, simultaneously imaging and measuring the force response uh, stiffness in particular task tip, it might be different. Why can't you directly go for normal tip? Uh, okay. So the reason is, for first of all, there is no issue in uh, imaging the cells and the force, force spectroscopy. We can do that. There are two different cameras. We can easily do that. that. That is not an issue. Only we have to align it. And second question is, uh, like you asked, why we are not using the normal tip? Uh, see, we want to mimic the system in a way it is normally in the biological uh, aspect, the, the places through which these cells go through. And also, uh, these micropore channels images that you see, it is not like a, like a, a throne, like a kata nahi. It's, it's, it's like not sharp things. It is like an entire uh, body is uh, putting the probe on it. So the cantilever that we are using, it has a 4.5 micron bead attached to it. So we want to do a whole body uh, probing rather than a local probing on the cell. Because uh, these, these micropore uh, probing is like entire cell is getting probed. So that is why we are not using uh, these sharp tips. So people have used these sharp tips and I can also tell this that if we change the probing mechanism, if we change the uh, shape of the probing tip, like it is sharp or it is blunt, then also the mechanical numbers that we get are going to be different. Because these numbers are not just for the red, these cells, but it is uh, in numbers that we get from the incorporation, incorporation of the adherence, the surface, the, the protocol with which these cells are being adhered, and the probing tool. So it is not, if we probe it extra, for example, Shantan asked the viscoelastic uh, measurements. So we are only in the uh, elastic region. So there are different parameters coming into the picture. So uh, just to mimic, the system, same to our uh, micropore experiments, and in our body, the way it goes through these occlusions. That is why we stick to these uh, cantilever shapes. Uh, so let's thank our speaker once again. Uh, and uh, our last talk for this session is by Oyan, uh, fluctuations in non-equilibrium environments. OK, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate and thank the organizers for putting this beautiful event. Uh, can I get the? for putting together this beautiful uh, event uh, once again. And today I'll talk about uh, fluctu uh, fluctuations in a non-equilibrium environment. Uh, the fonts are all jumbled up as I can see. And uh, so keeping in mind the, the broad audience, I'll uh, basically give an overview uh, so that at the end of the talk, uh, it becomes clear what I wanted to do in this paper. And uh, yes, so I'll begin with something which I think all of us are familiar with. So basically the Newton's laws of motion. So if you know the initial conditions and the force acting on a single particle, uh, you can predict, uh, I mean, all the future, uh, where the particle is and what its velocity are and all the future conditions of the particle. Uh, but <coughs> this is not so, uh, not such a good, uh, Formalism, if you consider, uh, if you want to uh, observe a dust particle, say, in air. So then what you have to do is basically you have to keep track of all the forces uh, that this, uh, this, if you consider this to be the dust particle and the remaining blues to be the air molecules, then you have to keep track of all the, all the forces bet uh, that are acting between the red and the blue ones, which, is basically some, which basically sums up to solving some Avogadro number of equations of motion at uh, each each instant of time. 
So what people usually do in such cases is they uh, actually approximate this equation to something like this, which is called the Langevin equation, where uh, the effect of this interaction with the air of the dust particle with the air molecules is basically encoded in these two uh, in these two terms. So one is a dissipation term which is proportional to the instantaneous velocity at all times, and the other is a random forcing term, which is delta correlated in time. This is delta correlated because there are the, I mean, the air molecules are considered to be much faster than the, uh, the dust molecules, and you get a large number of collisions, and thus there is kind of no memory effect between people. Right, so <coughs> this uh, equation was proposed by Paul Langevin in 1908 based on purely phenomenological grounds, and if, you, if one assumes that the air or the medium in which the dust particle is, is at a thermal equilibrium at temperature T, then you can actually calculate the different correlations from this equation. And what you, uh, and if you, uh, if uh, the uh, medium is in a thermal equilibrium at a temperature T, you would expect the kinetic energy of the dust particle to relax to KBT at large times. And if you use that, you get this equation. Uh, you get this relation between the, so gamma was the strength of the random force. And what you get that the strength of the random force is related to the dissipation in the system. Okay, and uh, typically for colloidal particle in air, like the dust particles or pollen grains in air, the velocity relaxation time uh, is much, is very fast. And the observable physics is uh, very well described by an overdamped Langevin equation, which Typically, which is the most more familiar uh, Langevin equation, which people uh, associate with diffusion, with d being the diffusion coefficient, and uh, uh, this d is basically proportional to temperature and inversely proportional to the damping in the system, which is which was uh, a, a relation which was proposed by which was given by Einstein in a different way, of course, starting from kinetic theory. But uh, yeah, so now can one actually? Uh, derive these Langevin equations starting from the microscopic equations of the environment. And this, this, this thing is particularly essential to provide theories of cold atoms where the temperatures are very low and, <coughs> oh, there are bullets here. So the temperatures are very low and the thermal fluctuations literally vanish and it's basically the quantum fluctuation which govern the dynamics and everything of the system. And the standard procedure <coughs> of quantization, of course, requires a Lagrangian or Hamiltonian, so you cannot just write down a Langevin equation like the previous one. Uh, so typically, what one uses here is this open system uh, formalism, where there are many, uh, many other uh, ways of uh, dealing with this, so uh, other than the one I'll be talking about. So there's a Lenblatian formalism, there's something which is called the quantum master equation formalism. But uh, I'll talk about today, uh, talk about this generalized Langevin equation. So what people do is they take a system, Hamil they take a total Hamiltonian, which comprises of a system Hamiltonian, a Bath Hamiltonian, and a system Bath coupling Hamiltonian. And what they do is you typically <coughs> write down the Heisenberg for quantum or the Hamiltonian equations of motion for the system and the reservoir separately. And then you formally integrate out the reservoir of the Bath degrees of freedom and then you use it in the uh, system equations of motion to get a generalized Langevin equation for the time evolution of any, any operator. And uh, in classical systems, if you're looking at uh, the, say the position evolution, if you want to look at the position evolution of uh, a system, you would end up getting a generalized Langevin equation, and which looks kind of similar to the previous uh, Langevin equation we wrote, except now the dissipation has a memory that is, the dissipation depends not only on the instantaneous velocity, but on velocities in the past as well. Uh, yeah, so the form of these uh, dissipation kernel, with this gamma, fun gamma function and this eta, they, the exact forms depend on the kind of Hamiltonian we start from. But uh, what is uh, true in, in whatever Hamiltonian we choose is uh, these two relations. So first is, uh, which is similar to the one I derived, uh, I showed uh, this, uh, the diffusion constant being related to the uh, damping coefficient. So the autocorrelation of this noise is always related to the dissipation kernel by this relation, which is called the fluctuation dissipation theorem of the second kind. And if you perturb the system by some using some external force, and then you would see that the response to that external force is governed solely by the 
correlations of that operator uh, in absence of that external perturbation. So the takeaway message from all of this is basically A is any operator. So you, you suppose it's a position, you respond in position uh, due to the external perturbation and that would be governed by the position autocorrelations in equilibrium. And so the takeaway message from all of this is basically the most general way you can model dynamics in an equilibrium environment is to add these two forces, a uh, uh, dissipative force and a fluctuating force which satisfy the fluctuation dissipation theorem. Now what happens if the environment is out of equilibrium? Uh, so there are numerous examples of out of equilibrium. I think Saurabh uh, in the last slide told about uh, these actin uh, filaments which uh, form a part of our blood cells and uh, muscles, etc. And uh, I mean, uh, and there are, it, it also like when uh, now there are intracellular, these drug transports and everything. And uh, oh, this uh, picture is completely messed up. So the reason I got interested in, so uh, suppose you consider bacterial, two bacterial col colonies, and these bacterial colonies, they can, uh, they have their, they can generate their own energy. And now somehow if you can, uh, if you, if you uh, make a bridge between these two bacterial colonies by some kind of a conductor, uh, mechanical conductor, you would expect that energy would flow from one side to the other. So this is, uh, we did the, the work which we did last year. And uh, so the, the, so the point is uh, when you're trying to model a colloid or a bead in a non-equilibrium environment, the traditional Langevin <coughs> equations are not good descriptions because the equilibrium properties and the relations, they don't hold. So how do you understand uh, the effects in uh, the effects of a non-equilibrium environment is you put a probe particle uh, in the non-equilibrium medium, you look at its observable properties, and then you infer <coughs> things about the environment from there. So numerous experimental and numerical works based on microbiology. So this is basically the statement is basically the basis of microbiology experiments, which people here are more uh, expert in. And yeah, there are numerous ex experimental and numerical work based on this microbiology, which has been done in the past uh, decade and a half. And usually the theoretical model works in this uh, area, use the phenomenological models to describe the effect of this non-equilibrium environment. And very recently, there has been two uh, theoretical com completely theoretical works which have come up, which take some approximate techniques to derive uh, equation of motion of a colloidal bead in a non-equilibrium environment. Okay, so uh, I'll present here in this paper what I did is uh, we had some exact results. So the model system is basically if you put a colloidal particle in a bacterial suspension, so and uh, to first approximation, what, uh, uh, what is there in this model is basically the bacterial part, the bacteria themselves not interacting, and it only interacts with the probe particle, and the, uh, it interacts with the probe particles by linear springs, linear attractive springs, springs, and uh, and these green particles are the bacterial particles which are modeled by stochastic equations like uh, this, the black equations. And this xi's are basically the propulsion velocity. If you look at the typical dynamics of a bacteria, is that it typically propels itself in one particular direction, and uh, it, it kind of moves persistently in one direction. And as a result, you would expect that the velocity is correlated till some particular point in time. And this correlation is basically uh, given by this, uh, is determined by this factor alpha sitting in the autocorrelation function here. And this uh, time scale, uh, which is determined by alpha, gives a measure of the activity of the system. And of course, coming back to the equation of the probe, you see that the probe equation here, the equation of motion for the probe is basically just a Newton's equation, where these yi's are sitting here. And now what we can do here exactly is, because all these are linear equations, you can uh, write exact solutions of these equations. And then you can use the equation uh, solution for y in the solution for in, in the system equation, and you end up getting a closed equation of motion for the system, which is again a generalized Langevin equation, where the, the now the mass of the, the effective mass of the probe is now scaled by the number of particles, and uh, the dissipation kernel has an exponential uh, decaying form, and the effective correlations are of, has a general form like this, irrespective of whatever this, whatever form of this die is. 
and taking the usual form of these xi's are as I said in the last slide, the xi's are usually exponentially correlated and if I take <coughs> an exponentially correlated form of the xi, what I would get for the autocorrelation of the effective noise is basically an, uh, a, a relation like this and if it were equilibrium then uh, it would have been just the black part and you see there is an extra, uh, extra part which appears here which is the sole effect of uh, this non-equilibrium environment and this is basically the modified fluctuation distribution theorem. And uh, there are two interesting limits of this equation. One is the small activity limit. So in this small activity limit which is given by this, uh, we regain back the equilibrium like relation with an effective temperature. So now uh, basically the you can consider in this limit you can consider that the colloid or the probe particle is in an equilibrium environment. And the other is a strong coupling or the large activity limit. Both descriptions are equivalent. This is given by this. And in this limit, you see that the memory kernel, uh, the exponential form of the memory kernel, this goes to a delta function and uh, the effective noise correlation takes the simple form of exponentially correlated uh, noise. So this is particularly interesting because uh, it has been used in experimental papers before as well as some phenomenological uh, models that uh, I mean in, in, in previously. And of course, uh, it's also advantages in experiments because one of the problems you face when doing experiments with bacteria is I guess the bacteria die quite soon. But here in this particular limit, you can, I mean, if you have this, if you somehow reach this particular limit, you can put this probe particle in a bacteria and somehow maintain, just maintain the concentration of the bacteria and look at the observable motion of the bacteria and the, of, the, of the probe, which won't die of course because it's just a colloidal particle and then you can basically, uh, I mean, see all the effects of the bacterial motion uh, reflecting on this probe. And uh, the last part is basically <coughs> response to external perturbation. So this is how, I mean, uh, I mean, this say delta V is the response to external perturbation. So this uh, uh, VT average is with uh, the average of, average of this quantity, okay, 215, right? Okay. Uh, so, uh, this is with uh, the perturbation, F is the perturbation and this is without the perturbation and uh, this is given by this response relation which is this R uh, uh, superscript V is the velocity response. And what it turns out, I showed you the equilibrium forms that in equilibrium the response uh, function solely depends on the equilibrium autocorrelation. So the ones on the left hand side are equilibrium autocorrelations. So here what you find is this red, there is an additional red part which actually tells you, I mean, tells you that the equilibrium forms are violated. And more importantly, the equilibrium forms would be violated that you know a priori, of course. Uh, but more importantly, you get an exact modified uh, fluctuation response relation for both uh, velocity and position. And uh, interestingly, it has been uh, said in the stochastic thermodynamics literature before that the extent of this uh, fluctuation response relation violation basically gives us a measure of the heat dissipation and entropy production in the system. And uh, yeah, I do a lot of other things like the mean square velocity, displacement and uh, of course for the detailed derivations you can check the paper or ask me. And uh, yeah, there's another interesting thing, uh, an ongoing work, we are doing an active Rubin model which is now the bacteria are talking to themselves. But again they are, uh, so basically I model the environment by a chain of uh, bacterial particles. And again, this model is exactly solvable. And interestingly, what happens here, the dissipation kernel and the effective noise has flat tails here. So this is something uh, which is, uh, uh, you don't expect to generate uh, so easily, but uh, we are getting uh, these power law tails for, uh, I mean, power law tails for the effective description of uh, this probe particle in this kind of a model. And if you want an introduction of Rubin model, we studied it in the context of quantum Brownian motion some years ago, you can take a look at this. Yeah, so this is the summary. Basically, the black points I've already covered and uh, the exact forms of the fluctuation dissipation theorems, modified FDTs will help in understanding on equilibrium thermodynamics and in future we would like to uh, do better models of active, active environments uh, with uh, short range interactions and also including hydrodynamic interactions and so on. And I would like to thank Sanjeev, Burna and Janssen for uh, useful discussions during the course of this work. And yes, thank you. Thank you. Have to have some questions. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, questions? So, uh, just a quick question. Uh, so, uh, why are you uh, modeling the bacteria like the 
interaction between bacteria and the particle with spring yeah. because I missed like uh, you are in dilute limit right so right. from where the elasticity is coming really no not the elasticity basically uh, whatever the potential is uh, whatever the interaction force mm. is so in, uh, in in a crude limit you can always say that uh, I mean it's harmonic to the first approximation so this is kind of the first approximation that it's harmonic I see so any uh, the and collision no kind of thing no, can no, be no, modeled? No, 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 okay. no. I mean, then I mean, exact solvability is gone once, okay. once you do that. This I is see. basically a model. Uh, this is uh -huh. called the independent oscillator model or this uh, okay. feynman Vernon model, which was used in this uh, open quantum systems long time back in I 1960s. See. No, because bacterial bug can develop elasticity. In my opinion, right. that should be in high bacterial limit, actually, uh, where like, the interaction between them might also interaction be between the bacteria bacteria okay, also okay. Uh, become yeah. important so okay. that again uh, some uh, for my uh, an interacting bath model would be this rubin model okay. but again this is also harmonic so you can complain okay. for this one as well okay thanks yeah. sumiti uh, just the previous slide uh, you talked about these violations i didn't quite understand in what sense are these violations so you're saying that so uh, you had those you know, you have the fluctuation dissipation one and two. Are you saying that in these systems there's a violation of that, or is it something? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so what? Uh, I, I, yeah, can you just sort of summarize that a little bit so more? Yeah. So this uh, in in usual the equilibrium-like relations, you won't have these red uh, red ones, the red parts. So this basically comes from this. Uh, I mean, the if you look at the dynamics of these y's. So the dynamics are of y's. If you look at this particular relation, uh, this particular equation, if you forget the interaction and forcing, if you just look at the bare equation, then this equation itself uh, is uh, essentially a non-equilibrium equation because if you look at the different properties, it doesn't satisfy detail balance, doesn't obey time reversal symmetry, and uh, so these essentially this dynamics is basically reflects on that uh, in that way. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The dissipation is still coming from the environment. Uh, the thermal, you can put it as an additional noise, but it doesn't uh, because these uh, usually these uh, these are orders of magnitude. These propulsion velocities are orders of magnitude higher than the thermal fluctuations, so you typically don't uh, see any. Right. The bath is also giving me a dissipation, but you can also put bath can also give a thermal part uh, in addition to this here. Yeah. So basically, what happens is more energy. So basically, these 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 are these are kind of uh, bacteria or living objects. So they consume energy from the surroundings and they kind of eat it and they use it to run around heat absorbed by the particle, it will keep on heating up the particle or? Uh, if, if the bacteria are alive, I guess, yes. No, whatever your model, right? Is, there is no bacteria in that model. There is, right? Uh, this one. I, mean, I can't see any bacteria. I only see X and Y. No, no whatever it, this it, model. It, it can, it, I, I mean, mean it, given it, that it, model, uh, yeah. will it gen, uh, gen, uh, pump energy into the system? Mm -hmm. Yes. It and if you yes, and if you uh, that that you can control, like if you confine the entire system in some kind of a trap or something, uh, and uh, you put in some optical trap or something, then you can confine the system in a particular region in space, and then I think you would eventually reach some kind of a stationary state. I mean, stationary state, and then if you look at the expectations of these quantities, it would saturate to some some quantity. I think we have reached the end of the first session, so let's thank Ayan and all other speakers. <laughs> We have three speakers. The first speaker is Rahul Sharma. He will be talking about broadband millihertz QPOs and spectral study of LMC X4 with Astrostat. Good morning, everyone. So I'll be talking about this X-ray, binary X-ray pulsar LMC X4, it's the result. So X-ray pulsars are neutron star, which are stellar dead core. Hello. Okay, so pulsars are neutron star, which are stellar dead cores, and so they are the most stable con configuration, compact co configuration. If the some, uh, further compression is started, it will collapse into the black hole. So, 
न्यूट्रॉन स्टार आर जनरली स्पिन वेरी फास्ट दे कैन स्पिन एट द पीरियड ऑफ हंड्रेड्स टू मिली सेकेंड्स पीरियड एंड इफ न्यूट्रॉन स्टार इज विथ फास्ट रोटेशन एंड हैव हाई मैग्टिक फील्ड एंड इफ दिस सिस्टम आर इन बाइनरी देन द मैटर फ्रॉम द कंपेन ऑफ बाइनरी दिस कंपेन स्टार टू दिस न्यूट्रॉन स्टार द मैटर फ्रॉम द कंपेन फॉल टू द न्यूट्रॉन स्टार एंड दिस गिव एक्रीशन सो combining all these things it will form an x-ray pulsar so x-ray pulsar the material falls from the this companion star form a disk or through the wind this material will channel by the high magnetic field of this neutron star to the magnetic polar cap as the neutron star spins and when the x-ray beam pass pa cross over line of sight then we see the pulses so that's how we see the x-ray pulsations now lmc x4 is system similar to this it has an accretion disk and star is something like here and in the lmc x4 this system is actually this disk is wrapped so this form a this because of different orbital inclination we see we see different density because some part of the disk absorb this extra intensity so it show a clear sinusoidal kind of variation over the long period so this period is around 30 days which we call as super orbital period and this system is a binary system so we know its orbital period is around 1.4 days and its spinning period is around 13 seconds so we took the observation of astrosat arkal bar observation of this source which was carried during the this peak flux of this modulation and this is the light curve of the this lmc x4 so we actually started the work for, for this source in different focus but we found different result so we actually aim to model this eclipse because this is eclipsing high mass x-ray binary the companion star sometimes during the this orbital motion this or companion star obscure the uh, neutron star completely and suddenly there is a drop in the x-ray flux so which is we call as a eclipse so we aim to study the eclipse but we found something else so i'm presenting that that result so this is the power spectrum of this access x ray data so power spectrum generally give the fourier transform of the any light curve and generally has the noise component and if there is any signal it will give you a single peak now we have removed the poisson noise which is generally in all x ray data is there poisson noise we subtract the poisson noise which is above 1 hertz so we remove all that noise and whatever see is the this noise and as there is a signal of 13.5 second we see a high bin peak even peak is there one bin is there which correspond to 74 millihertz which is 13.5 second which is spin fundamental which is because of the spinning of the neutron star and there is a harmonic at double of that frequency addition to that in this noise we see a broad hump feature is there in the power spectrum so this is actually because of the at some certain frequency a high power is accumulated and which is giving the broad feature but it is not very coherent that's why we are not seeing a single peak coherent signal is from the spinning of the neutron star which we see the pulses and this will give the coherent signal but this is a broad feature so we call it a quasi periodic oscillation so but this signal is there but is quasi periodic it's not purely periodic so we found its spin period of this 13.5 something and qpo this qpo feature is at centered around 26 millihertz so we studied its variation with the energy how this qpo is changing with the energy so we used the astrosat lexbc data which has broad energy coverage from 3 to 80 kv but we found that we can detect the this qp of between 3 to 40 kv only above 40 kv there was no not enough signal to noise ratio so we study this qp qp is certainly stable all four bands that we divided and we found this rms of that the strength of this qp is slightly increasing with the energy but all the error bar is long large we cannot say with very high significance it is actually increasing but we found some trend so now as we have discussed this periodic signal also from the spinning so we folded the all the data and created a pulse profile so this is the pulse profile how the pulse profile look in different energy bands so this is the overall all energy band which is so complex structure in the pulse profile so it is one spin of the neutron star which we have folded into multiple we have combined the multiple spins and created one profile and if we divide into different energy it show different structures so in low energy it show dipping kind of structure like a very narrow dip in this pulse profile 
and as we go to energy, this deep structure evolves, and we see at high energy we see a sinusoidal kind of profile. So this dip actually is because of the material is falling to the neutron star pole, and this material sometimes obscure the emission stream. So because of the emission is obscured by this, there is a sudden drop in the X-ray flux. But this X-ray flux generally affect the soft energies because the soft energy get absorbed in the material. But hard X-ray pass through it. So we see this dip in the soft energies, but not in the hard energies. So this, because of this, we see this different complex structure. If we combine all these, we see this complex X-ray pulse profile, X -ray pulse profile from the source. So this is the variation of the pulse fro pulse fraction pulse fraction gives the this by this formula this gives the strength of the how the pulse is big means what is the strength of the pulses so we divide, we, we calculate the pulse fraction of all these bands and we found that this stru this stru structure is there generally x ray pulsars show the increasing trend in the pulse profiles so this pulse fraction generally increases but we found, we found that there is a certain a, a narrowed kind of dip at 10 kV, which is actually due to this obscuration. So there is a narrow dip in the pulse profile, which actually increases or sometimes it decreases the pulse fraction, which affects the pulse fraction. But if we go by high energy, we found that this is consistent with the increasing trend of the pulse fraction. As these are hard X-ray pulsator, so we expect to have pulse fraction increase with the energy. So we found this is very consistent with the observed result, previous observed result also. Next come the energy spectrum. So first we study the time uh, power density spectrum, how these timing properties behave and this thing. Then we study the energy spectrum. So we in this case we use two instruments of the LAXBC. One is the SXT. SXT is the soft X-ray telescope, and LAXBC is a large area X-ray pulsation counter. So combining both, we can get the bro very broad energy coverage from 0.5 to 25 kV. So generally these systems, if I go back. So generally, these systems have the energy component, which is a X-ray emission coming from the neutron star. Okay, and other component is this X-ray emission get reprocessed in the disk. So this emission goes to the disk, get reprocessed and re re-edited, re and so we have we see this reprocessed X-ray emission. So same thing we also observed in the in this spectrum. So this spectrum, this component is we model is a power law cutoff power law with high energy exponential cutoff, which is describing the emission from the neutron star itself. Now we see also saw if some soft axis. This axis is there in the spectrum at low energy, which is actually due to the reprocess emission, which is coming from the accretion disk, which we can model as a black body. So it is radiating, and so emission is going to the disk, and it's radiating back. And we, 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 found, we found this soft axis. Addition to this, we also found three emission lines so in SXT, we found two neon line of neon 9 and neon 10. And these lines were significantly detected above 3 sigma. And also we found this a broad iron emission line. So these emission lines has been observed in this, uh, these kind of sources, X-ray pulsars. We also found in these cases. Generally, this also shows some oxygen line, but this band is not very sensitive, is not very good. So we could not constrain the oxygen line. So this is the overall spectrum. So to summarize, in this work, we study the high mass X-ray pulsar. Our aim was different, little bit, but we found something else. Uh, so this pulse period we detected, and we found this energy-dependent pulse profile, which showed different dips, like structure complex dips, like structure in soft energies, which is due to the absorption from the accretion material, is, which is falling to the neutron star polar caps. The main, thing, main, detect, main result of this was the detection of 26 millihertz QPO in this case. And since this QPO is like, generally this QPO is because of the immunogeneity in the accretion disk. As accretion disk is rotating around the, this pulsar, if there's an immunogeneity that can cause some variability, and this variability will cause some high power in some certain energy beams, both frequency beams. So this, this QPO can be explained by the beat frequency model, where the spinning of the neutron star and rotation of this material in the accretion disk will beat and will cause this QPO. 
So if we use this weak frequency model, we can estimate the region of this emission, which is around 78,000 kilometer far. So this QPO is actually coming from the 70,000 kilometer from the neutron star. So it is a very high magnetic field neutron star, so this can be truncated at very far distance because it has very large magnospheric radius. And we also found this uh, energy spectrum, which is for this X-ray pulsar, it can be described as the emission from the neutron star polar caps, which can be described the power law with a high energy exponential cutoff. And a soft and thermal component, which is coming from the accretion disk, reprocessed emission. And emission lines from the iron neon, neon highly ionized neon. OK, so I'll stop here. Okay. Thanks, Rahul, for finishing well ahead of time. We can take a few questions. Uh, thanks, Rahul. Nice talk. Uh, the spectrum that you showed is for the, no, not here, the one which, uh, yeah, here. Uh, has it been analyzed for different uh, energy levels? Yes, do you yes. see the so same? This is for different energies. Okay, sorry, I missed to see that. So the peak that the different energy levels are also shifting. So do you have a number where the peak? Uh, so this is the center of the peak. QP frequency. So it is between 24 and 26 something. Okay. And any effect of the Doppler uh, aspect? No, no, we, uh, in this QPO, we do not see the Doppler effect. But in spin frequency, we see the Doppler effect. So if we not correct for binary motion, the spin frequency will be different. So this one is actually corrected for Doppler motion, the spin. So pulse file, these pulse file created, correct, were created after the correcting for the Doppler motion. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a very small question. Uh, you saw a reduction uh, at around 10 kV of the pulse fraction, pulse right? Pulse, yes. So what is that exact bin, uh, uh, like value? Uh, of 6 to 12. Oh, 6 so to pulse profile. So uh, can this be due to the iron line? No, no, okay. it is not due to that. It's because of this absorption structure, no? it's because of that. So it's about spin. It's a spin to neutron stars and all. Yes. Can you elaborate on that? What kind of uh, magnetic dipole moment it has? So generally, we for, mod for simple model, we consider a yeah. simple dipole, mo okay. dipole for calculation. Similar to but neutron or? Uh, the neutron star is just a compact, of compact star, yeah. which is rich in neutron star, which is actually stable because of the neutron degeneracy pressure. Mm -hmm. There is no fusion is going. Yeah. Okay. If there is no degeneracy pressure, it will collapse and form a black hole. Yeah. Because so whatever is it for neutron, how it contributes into magnetic dipole moment is not clear. This, so far it is not known to no, no, any no. of There is a structure is also known, not yeah. known. There is some study which show that it is not multipole magnetic field is there. Yeah. And sometimes the pole is not in the uh, like opposite direction. They are yeah. in the same hemisphere. So there this has also no charge there. actually. Hmm? This neutron star, there is nothing. There, it has no charge like thing. It is only spinning. No charge means it is charge, like a lot of yeah, it, uh, charge uh, particles. Similar to there. neutron in the atom. No, that is single neutron. This is a okay. com, com, yeah. combination of all this yeah. element and yeah. so it is like simple yeah. star, but different f physics is going on there. Yeah. We'll move on to the next speaker. Let's thank Rahul again for answering your questions. The next speaker is S. Kirti Priya. She will be talk talking about design of a water-based compact coaxial delay line. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. So I'll be talking on design of water-based uh, compact coaxial delay lines. This work was done along with uh, Dr. Ragnathan and Mr. Nagraj from EEG. So I'll be outlining on uh, using water as a substrate, as such, and then the theoretical formulation how we calculate the dielectric constant for composite substrates and how did we build the coaxial lines which are water based. So the primary objective of this whole uh, research uh, was that when we go on to lower frequencies, typically in the order of some 360 megahertz or 30 megahertz, let's say, the delay lines or the phase shifters which you build, they will be generally very long in the order of few meters or few centimeters. Um, so the problem is when you want to use it for you know beam forming applications, then um, you might end up with having like a uh, lot of space occupied by these delay lines. So we wanted to do some uh, research on how to reduce the length of the lines. Um, so one thing is these lengths of the lines as such, they depend a lot on the medium in which it gets implemented. So, so therefore our research direction went into seeing whether we can increase the dielectric constant as such and build some uh, delay lines or coaxial lines. 
Uh, so as such, commercially, if you see the RF cables, which you might have seen, they all are made up of a material called Teflon, which has dielectric constant of around 2. Um, and the maximum dielectric constant, even if you go for like a planar substrate as such in market today, they will be of the order of 10 or 12. Uh, so therefore, uh, we went on to see whether we can make some material which might have some higher dielectric constant beyond like 10 or 12. So then we came across um, water as such. Uh, which has a very high dielectric constant of the order of 80. So if you see from 2 to 80, that's like a huge jump. So we thought, why don't we use this property of water and build some circuits with that? But it has its own challenges and it's noteworthy here that uh, no one has ever implemented or tried something on this aspect. So we tried uh, uh, our hands on this problem and we have succeeded in uh, overcoming some challenges and we have built some circuits and delay lines using water. So before we start uh, building something, we need to understand basically the substrate properties. Therefore, see now if, we say, if I say water today, we have different kinds of water, tap water, mineral water, so many things are there. So then we wanted to understand how, how does the electrical properties of that behave. So typically we want our water to behave as a good substrate like an insulator. So we don't want the conductivity as much as possible. And the loss tangent parameter here, you can understand that as the loss provided by the substrate itself to the RF signals. So we want that to be as low as possible and the conductivity also to be low. And these properties were satis satisfied by distilled water basically. And that also distilled water is like standardized procedures are there to make it and therefore the properties might not change uh, from material to material we thought, water to water. So therefore we then uh, thought of using distilled water as a substrate uh, and prefer that over the normal you know tap water or mineral water let's say so then this talk i already gave last in house that time we were researching on building the microstrip circuits on water and uh, we have actually succeeded in building the microstrip based uh, transmission line or a delay line this picture here will show you the comparison on how much length reduction we can get so this line here this is a normal commercial coaxial line and for the same delay to be achieved our water based transmission line has this much length and this reduction is about a factor of 2.5 times uh, but um, so now we are proceeding on to building more circuits on this like filters and all on this but one limitation with this we uh, we couldn't go beyond an value of 25 here uh, primarily because when you implement something like this micro strip line half of the electric lines get coupled to the air and then half of them gets coupled to the substrate below it so there is a limitation because of the air surrounding this micro strip line you cannot achieve beyond a certain value of dielectric constant. Um, also, we were restricted or limited by this thickness of the PCB layer, the first layer uh, thickness, which was practically available. So we could achieve 25, which was like 2.5 times reduction, but we were also exploring options to somehow increase it beyond 25. That is when we thought of implementing something on coaxial lines. So if you see the coaxial typical configuration, you have like a center conductor, surrounded completely by some dielectric material and then enclosed by a metal. This is a typical configuration. So here the problem of air coming into picture as an additional substrate is not there. So we had a hunch like you know we can achieve more dielectric constant if we do something with this. So then this is like a theoretical formulation which is a very standard ones for multi-layer dielectric, uh, multi-layer coaxial lines. Uh, so here the only two equations which we can concentrate now is just the impedance and then the epsilon effective. So typical coaxial lines or the RF lines which you will see, they are all of 50 ohm impedance commercially. So we also wanted to build something which is like around 50 ohms but using higher dielectric constants. So then we went on to analyze this theoretically like how these equations uh, have the relationships. So what we did here, if you see the plot here is we varied the water substrate thickness and uh, calculated the effective permittivity how it varies and here I had kept my uh, so if you see the basic diagram here, there is one outermost PVC layer and then there is one E1 which is the innermost PVC layer. E2 will be water typically. That was the configuration which we had in mind. So what I did was fix two of them and then varied the water thickness and then calculated the effective permittivity as well as the impedance. So inferences from this plot was that uh, the lower the thickness of the first layer PVC we have, the higher uh, effective permittivity we can achieve. And similarly, if you want impedances close to 50 ohms, again the PVC thickness of the first layer has to be very low, which is in the order of 0 0.05 mm. These are the two inferences from this. Uh, and also like water thickness has to be as high as possible if you want to achieve a higher dielectric constant. 
So one more analysis what we did was then we fixed this water substrate thickness, we fixed the inner PVC thickness and then the outer PVC thickness everything and we just varied the center rod uh, diameter to see how much the effective permittivity varies. So here you can see that if I have my rod to be 1 mm dia, then I am able to achieve the highest effective permittivity. So based on this, we then optimized our dimensions of coaxial line to have these particular dimensions so that we can achieve a impedance close to 50 ohms as well as achieve a epsilon effective which is above 25. So then uh, once we fixed these values, we went on to model them in our software uh, simulation tools and then we wanted to uh, say get the same value of around 25, 28 in our simulations also. But one problem which we will have is, uh, so in simulations we can see directly it will give us the directory constants, but how do, in measurement, we assets did not have any measurement probes to measure this dielectric constant of the whole line. So then we had to make some techniques or do some back calculations from our measurement results to calculate the effective permittivity achieved. So for that we then used three different techniques. So, so I will just brief about these techniques once. So the basic principle behind all these techniques is one thing. Uh, like let's say I have a coaxial line which is 50 ohm impedance and then let it be terminated with some open circuit or a short circuit which is like a very hu uh, huge impedance difference is there. So the impedance mismatch that will cause lot of reflections of the RF signal as such and your signals will be you know getting reflected back and forth throughout and you will have these ripples which are generated. So these ripples they will actually come up in a parameter called as a return loss which is like one main parameter which we do for RF measurements. So this return loss will have something like these ripples just because of the impedance mismatch. And if you try to measure this frequency difference between the peaks or the troughs, from that we can back calculate our epsilon effect or the dielectric constant of the material. So this is one approach. The other approach was to use the impedance characteristics as such. So this was one parameter called S11 and this is one parameter called as Z11 we say. And in this also the same principle, you can just see these plots here, these variations, they, they are actually like a tangential or cotangential variations we say. So the impedance if you measure at the input of the line, they will have these kinds of variations which will be periodic with respect to a wavelength of lambda by 2. So here also if we try to measure the frequency difference between the successive peaks, we can actually go back to the uh, dielectric constant based on this particular equation. So from this then uh, we did the simulations and from simulations you can see here we are getting the similar kind of like how the theory says we got a similar kind of line in our simulation. We just took the peak to peak difference and then we calculated um, and we were able to get simulation values close to 39. Now once we got the simulation uh, results like this we also wanted to understand since we are building a, a delay line we wanted to see how the parameters of length and epsilon effect to play a role in building a delay line. So what we did in that case was just um, keep one of the parameter constant and vary the other two and see what happens. So I will just uh, briefly say the inference from these plots that here if you see we have kept the dielectric constant uh, uh, for each of these lines as a constant which means the water thickness was kept constant and we varied the length of the transmission line and we calculated the delay. Now this is a very linear relationship as such as expected. Here if you see this, for a particular delay, we understood that maybe if we keep increasing our water thickness, we will achieve uh, you know, minimal lengths as possible. But uh, if you see here, even if we increase the thickness beyond a certain amount, the length does not reduce as proportionally as uh, we expected. So this was one inference. And then from here, we also saw that from these three lines, we had kept the length of the coaxial lines as constant and we kept the varied the dielectric constant and the calculated the delay of the lines. So here if you see these lines, the slope of the line seems to be varying for these three. So one inference was that the longer lines, they have like the delay varies much more with the water thickness rather than for the smaller lengths of line. So once we got a hold on understanding how to build delay lines and what parameters influence them, we went on to then making an actual design as such. Uh, but there are a lot of uh, challenges initially, but then we came around it with some ingenious uh, decisions as such. So this is our basic uh, idea of the design that there will be this red color is our center rod. It will be surrounded by a first PVC layer which is going to be now 0.1 mm thickness. And then it will be surrounded with this white area will be filled with water. And this entire thing will be enclosed by something uh, like a PVC tube. 
which will then be sitting on a uh, metal tube. So what did we do for the 0.1 mm thickness is uh, we didn't get any substrates or sleeves as such in that small thickness. So we ended up coating our rod with some material which is used in varnishes and that had a dielectric constant close to 3.5. Uh, so then we coated our rod with this material and then we made an enclosure. These, these tubes I think you would have seen in your homes uh, like water tubes or electrical tubes will be made up of these PVCs. We took that and then we used that as our enclosure. And then this was completely then enclosed in a metallic tube. Now then this, then we connectorized it and then we measured it. So this is our results. So one good thing you can note in this plot, this is our insertion loss, which is typically the loss provided by the lines. Uh, so commercial cables which you get, they also have the losses which will be of the order of 0.5 dB, 0.2 dB like that. And if you see the water delay lines which we have built, coaxial lines, they also have the loss which is very low. So around 30 megahertz our loss was like close to 0.1 dB and uh, at 360 megahertz the line had 1 dB loss. And similarly we did some calculations of dielectric constant from the Z parameter and the S parameters uh, and then we took an average of all those dielectric constants. Uh, we were able to achieve a dielectric constant which was very close to our simulation. Uh, so therefore we understand that uh, we have designed something as expected. Uh, but we are also trying to understand it uh, better way because you see this delay has a drift here. Uh, so delay is not very constant, it has a drift and we think it's primarily because of the water itself having a change in the dielectric constant. So we are trying to understand it in better way. So I would like to conclude here by saying that we have studied the water itself as a substrate and we have already uh, built circuits on it and delay lines on it using microstrip. We have achieved building delay lines also using that now. But we are moving forward and trying to build some more complex circuits on water. Um, and then uh, we will also be studying these delay lines in a better way. So I would like to thank our uh, MES team for their support in fabrication of all these uh, delay lines which you saw now. So thank you all. I am open for questions. Thanks, Keith. We can take a few questions. So theoretically, that's why um, we don't as such have any measurement probes, but we are uh, actually trying to get one measurement probe for water as such, but we went on with the theoretical uh, number which is 80. It, it varies between 78 to 80 and that's why probably you see these drifts also in the uh, delays. That might be because of this variation in the dielectric constant. But typically their values are around the 78 to 80. We don't know the exact value, but then once we get a measurement probe, we can definitely make that measurement. Yeah, no, uh, water has some uh, 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 relaxation uh, uh, because the dipole moments cannot uh, respond. So there is some uh, in the microwave region. Is it affects you? So what we observed was till 360 megahertz, these lines behave very well. Mm. Now we, when we go beyond 360 megahertz, we were seeing lot of variations in our uh, outputs mm. what we were getting. So mm. our understanding is it can work only till certain frequency. It cannot be implemented at higher frequencies. But at least till 360 megahertz, it is working fine. And I think it also solves the purpose because we aimed it to reduce our lens in lower frequency regions. Anyway, at higher frequencies, these lines will anyway have few millimeter, few centimeter lens, which is not anyway detrimental in our designs. But at lower frequencies, it is required more. So still that was okay with us. But we have observed that it doesn't work beyond 400 megahertz. Yeah. Actually, um, I mean, many dialectic measurements of some water-based system. It's a known that this is very difficult system to handle or yeah. measure these dialectic yeah. constants. Yeah. So I don't know, uh, I mean, how you will you overcome these difficulties of water-based systems. Yeah? Yeah. One more question. So loss tangent is typically you can understand that as uh, uh, maybe the absorption provided by the material itself to the RF signals. So loss tangent can be understood like that. This in RF region. Uh, in these regions, yeah. below 300 megahertz. Actually, we even implemented the micro strip uh, delay lens which I showed. We even implemented in our one of the systems or beam formers, and we are we have tested it and we have kept it out in the field for like at least two three days in sun, and we have yeah. seen the performance as uh, such. You want to measure in situ uh, uh, dielectric constant or uh, offline also? It's okay. Offline. Measurement is possible or you want offline to have in the sense, offline uh, in the sense taking it into the lab and then measuring the dielectric constant. Oh, actually. we have measured it like that only, right? Oh, you are measuring yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering whether you had any uh, possibility of checking it in different orientations. 
Right, the micro strip line we have done in different orientations because we have been doing work with that for quite a long time now. Micro strip line we understand very well and we have kept it in various orientations. We even took it to GBD and we did some uh, beam forming measurements with that and it seems to work fine. And we had built it like six months back and so far it performs the same way throughout. So we hope the performance of that is good. Coaxial line we have just built it and we yeah, are in the process of understanding it. And also one quick. Uh, maybe I just want to ask the drift phenomena for the normal, uh, you know, the tubular uh, strip and the tubular strip. Uh, do you see uh, uh, normal coaxial lines as such? No, no, no. no. The previous design and to the previous normal. Previous design did not have this much drift. We had like just a 10% drift variation you, when we did micro strip lines. But uh, here coaxial seems to have like 20% drift variation which we are trying to understand why because all the concepts are same but then this seems to have little more drift and compared to that. Maybe because that micro strip line was little more easy to fabricate but here we have we are like having a rod coated with some varnish. We don't know whether the varnish holds good, whether the performance of that varnish is good. So there are a lot of things which we still don't know but probably in few more months time we'll understand this better is our hope. Okay, let's thank the speaker now. The next speaker is Sachidananda Barik. He'll be speaking on shear thickening behavior of hydrophilic fumed silica suspensions. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing batch for the nice effort. And uh, I will be talking about the shear thickening behavior of hydrophilic fumed silica dense suspension. So in simple word, if you want to explain the dense suspension, if you add some solid particle into liquid, then you will end up with a suspension. And dense in the terms that your solid particle concentration need to be high enough. Uh, but it, it is interesting actually if you know the property of the solid particle and liquid separately, but still it is difficult to predict the behavior of the dense suspension as a whole. As you increase the con particle concentration, the, you, you will find a lot of interesting phenomenon. And today in this talk, I will be focusing on a particular kind of uh, property which is known as the shear thickening property. Shear thickening by means, if you apply some shear stress or shear rate, the viscosity of the suspension increases. It no longer remains same. There are material where the uh, viscosity will remain same. There are material where the viscosity will go drop. But this kind of phenomena where you apply shear stress or shear rate, the viscosity of the suspension increases. And this increase in viscosity, as you can see, it is quite depend of, dependent upon the volume fraction of the sample also. More the volume fraction is the uh, greater is the increase in viscosity. That is what the typically shear thickening means. As a result, what happens? The liquid like suspension, you can see that it will behave like solid. So you can run over the suspension, you can cycle over, you can actually play football, a lot of fun stuff. In the last video, you can see uh, right hand side video, there are two cylinders, inner cylinder and outer cylinder and there are some material inside. When the inner cylinder is rotating, it applies some shear to the suspension due to which the suspension becomes solid like. So that it can hold the weight of the iron ball. The moment it stops rotating, there is no longer shear is there, so some suspension behave liquid like, so uh, the iron ball sink. This is the beauty of the shear thickening suspension. When you apply shear stress, that time the suspension behave like uh, solid like. The moment you stop shear, it will behave like uh, liquid like. This is the beauty. Now why we are studying all these things? Because of its numerous uh, potential applications because such kind of material you can think of developing liquid body armors, adaptive materials, dampers, sensors, shock absorbers, lot of potential application you can think of. But the practical problem is that uh, for the shear thickening to observe you require high volume fraction. So particle concentration need to be high enough and uh, the suspension need to be stable because there are few uh, so fume silica suspension like polystyrene PEG which is a standard shear thickening suspension to synthesize the polystyrene particle in a bulk it's quite difficult and quite expensive also. Now uh, there are material like cornstarch in water you can get uh, huge amount of cornstarch particle put in water and get the uh, huge amount of uh, shear thickening material but the stability of the suspension is no longer remains the same because cornstarch will degrade with time and the water will evaporate. So today you prepare some su suspension and after two days the suspension will no longer behave like same. So there are a lot of challenges and uh, lastly it should be economical. So you can't spend huge amount of money to develop all these things. So here where the fume silica come into the picture. What is this fume silica is? 
these are the fractal aggregates of nano silica particles that means 20 30 nanometer particles they are actually fused together under high heat high temperature this is commercially available also so these are irreversible so there there are fractal in nature the nano size particles they are spheres or small particles but once they make the clusters they become fractal in nature so this is a typical image of aggregate how this fume silica looks like after the connection now in our study actually we use uh, six kind of fume silica suspension of different uh, specific surface area the specific surface area means due to the fractal nature actually even the mass is small the volume required by this kind of sample will be very high enough that that's why the surface to mass ratio that is high enough called as specific surface area is high enough so in this case we are using very specific surface area samples starting from ox50 to a380 these are the name of the samples ox51 name a380 one name depending upon the surface area these are these are the name and all are the hydrophilic this is what we are going to study and to prepare the uh, shear thickening sample we disperse this powder in glycerol so that the suspension will be quite of quite stable this is what uh, the uh, system but more interestingly even all this fume silica are fractal in nature the internal structure of this fume silica are not same not same in the sense what if you see this internal segments ni that is actually increasing drastically what is this internal segment segment signifies the internal branching inside a cluster inside the aggregates you have a fume silica aggregate which are fractal in nature but inside the aggregates the branching inside the uh, aggregates is different as you can see here this is a cartoon if you compare this ox50 to the a380 a380 internal branching is very high enough so we call it as a closed structure sample but here you can see this is internal branching are very less so we call it as an open structure so as you go from ox50 to a380 due to the increase in internal branching actually we are kind of going from more open structure to a more closed structure so this is what the, we have to keep in mind so that we can understand the results what we are going to study so the our major problem that you want to encounter what is the effect of this internal branching over different aspects of shear thickening we know shear thickening we have many samples who say we, we show shear thickening but is there any effect this internal branching has significant effect or not now to study these things what are the difference we get this is this shows shear thickening behavior with shear stress uh, viscosity increases although there are a lot of technicalities there and for the time being i'm leaving one major thing you can notice here the maximum weight fraction that you can go that is phi max that is significantly different from the standard spherical particles this si is the spherical particle Speri spherical particle weight fraction wise you can go 0.7 but as you go on the fractal system uh, fume silica system you can see this weight maximum weight fraction decreases drastically and more open structure can go higher uh, weight fraction and more closed structure that is a380 it, it will be end up with a very small weight fraction uh, maximum weight fraction and interestingly the range of weight fraction over which we can see the shear thickening that is the maximum weight fraction and the minimum weight fraction requirement to see this way shear thickening behavior that is actually quite different from the say, standard system standard system I, here i have considered polystyrene particles or silica particles here you can see the range is, will be very high for more open structure but when the structure is more closed the range is quite low but still it is very different from the standard system and major uh, difference that is quite uh, technical is that it won't obey the standard model available which explain the shear thickening behavior like uh, white cats model kaiga dot relationship uh, these are this system doesn't obey this kind of uh, models this model doesn't explain all these things and this is a little technical if anybody of is uh, interested about all this i will talk to this after the talk i'm free to i will love to talk about this now another interesting parameter is the onset stress what is this onset stress the minimum stress requirement to see the shear thickening behavior that i have marked for the constart systems as you can see for standard shear thickening system like polystyrene constart silica sphere the onset stress more or less remains same it is kind of independent of the weight fractions although there are few cases at high weight fraction your uh, onset stress can decrease little bit but more or less that is as kind of same 
But if you consider the fume silica sample, it is quite drastic in nature. You can see there is an exponential increase in onset stress as you increase the weight fraction, as you vary the weight fraction. And this happens for uh, all the six uh, types of fume silica samples. And for more fractal or more open structure, that is OX50, the onset stress is much more smaller compared to the more close structure for a particular weight fraction. Now, what is the cause behind it? It seems to be there is something, play, the fractal structure seems to be a uh, little bit significant in this kind of system uh, which controls the shear thickening behavior. To get into deeper insight, we take the help of in-situ boundary imaging, where what happens, uh, we image the surface boundary. We have uh, rheometer, we, have, uh, to, uh, we are using twin drive. We have top plate, we have bottom plate, and we are uh, using counter movement motion. The top plate moving in one direction, bottom plate moving in opposite direction, and the sample inside, and we are imaging uh, the sample boundary. Now, as the top plate moving in one direction, the velocity near the top plate, let's say it is uh, positive. So, velocity near the bottom plate will be negative and the zero velocity plane will be at the middle of the, uh, middle of the plane. So, that is the typical uh, flow profile behavior you can see. And all this line represents what is the flow behavior at different, different times. This is a time series. That's why a lot of lines are there. Now, if you observe the, if you look at the velocity profile, let's say at smaller stress, let's say at the uh, larger stress. As you can see here, the stress starts from very small value, linearly 1 Pascal to very high value. So, if you observe the flow profile at small stress value and some stress value which is beyond the onset stress value, then what you observe is the following. Like that, uh, you can see, if you can, the small stress value seems like the fluctuation is kind of little bit high enough, where the high stress value, the fluctuation is little bit small enough. Fluctuation in the sense, if I want to calculate the fl velocity fluctuation at a particular distance from the top plates, velocity fluctuation means temporal fluctuation. How the velocity for a particular stress varies with time? That is what I am, I am uh, observing. There is a huge fluctuation in both velocity and both the position of the zero velocity plane. But here the actually the fluctuation it decreases. To more quantify, uh, to quantify all these things, I have calculated the uh, standard deviation by mean. Here you can see the uh, zero velocity plane fluctuation actually kind of decreases. You can see all both zero velocity plane and the velocity fluctuation. Both fluctuation actually saturates near the onset stress. And for higher weight fraction sample requires higher stress to saturate uh, to minimize these fluctuations. This is similar to the onset stress variation kind of you can see. Then why you study all these things? The idea behind is that for observing the shear thickening, what you need, each of the plane of the uh, fluid need to be sheared homogeneously and uniformly. It's not like one plane is sheared, other planes are not sheared, and you will see the shear thickening. That it won't happen usually. So every plane need to be sheared homogeneously. And this fluctuation exactly reflects, that means there is some inhomogeneity still there between the shearing between each and every plane of the fluids. That's why, and this fluctuation die up when near the onset stress. That means when the shear thickening starts, around that the shearing will be quite uniform. That's why the shear thickening starts. And here you can see more the volume fraction will be, the, it will be difficult to shear each and every plane within a small stress. Why this happens exactly? Because of this fractal nature. Why? Because due to this fractal nature, they form a local stable structure and you require some stress to overcome this local stable structure to uh, 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 create some uniform motion or uh, homogeneous uh, shearing between the, all this plane. And more the weight fraction will be, particle concentration will be more, local structure will be formed and more difficult it will be. So more amount of stress required to make these things flow. That's why you can see the onset stress actually uh, keep on increasing with increasing in the uh, weight fraction. Now, if this picture is uh, true, another consequence we find like that uh, re-entrant to the weak shear thickening regime. What exactly it means? If you consider only one flow curve, you can see there is a shear thinning part. Shear thinning means viscosity drops with increasing shear stress. After certain stress, known as onsen stress, the viscosity increases. Yeah. But, uh, but the slope of the flow curve, you can see, it is no longer remains same. After certain stress, the slope changes. So there is a bending in the slope of the shear thickening regime. 
This bending actually usually happens when the structure is more open like OX50. If you go to the A300, A380 where the structure is more closed, that time this bending won't happen. That means this signifies this internal branching has lot of effect over this shear thickening uh, behavior. Now if you know and if you keep on increasing the weight fraction, you can see that this bending actually kind of disappears, it decreases. And if you know the onset stress, bending point stress and the maximum stress, you can plot a phase diagram. That means below the onset stress, there will be a shear thinning regime. And above this onset stress, there will be a shear thickening regime. And below certain stress point, that is known as the bending point stress, will enter into the another weak shear thickening regime. We call it as a re-entrant weak shear thickening regime. For standard system, this uh, region usually not available. That's why this is quite interesting in this kind of uh, fractal system. Now, beyond that, if you go, you will end up with a LD. So this re-entrant boundary actually that depends upon the varieties of the sample, depends on internal structure of the sample that you are using. As the more and more close structure you go, this boundary will shrink and eventually it will end up. That is the beauty of these things. So finally, I just want to conclude that uh, due to the uh, this uh, internal structure, internal branching of this uh, uh, fume silica, you can see that you can get a wide range of uh, wet fraction where you can see the uh, shear thickening. And more interestingly, there is a dramatic increase in the onset stress, which is exponential increase in onset stress, which is quite different from the standard conventional shear thickening systems. And uh, due to this fractal nature and this branching net, uh, nature, there will be a re-entrant regime where we can see it is entering into a from strong shear thickening regime to weak shear thickening regime before the LD. So finally, I just want to acknowledge my supervisor, Dr. Sainthan Mazumdar, Professor A.K. Sood, uh, Dr. Pradeep Bera for useful discussions and all my lab members for their active support. Thank you. Thanks. No, so in the last phase diagram that you showed, uh, you know, these phase boundaries, so is there some order parameter and characterize this uh, criticalities and so on? Uh, that, that depends upon what exactly, what is the nature of this transition. Unless you know the exact nature of transition, then defining order parameter is quite difficult because you have to know the, if you want to find the define order parameter, you should know the what is the transition. It is mostly frictional and we are in the process of uh, describing what might be the mechanism uh, from going one point to another point. Then only you can define a proper uh, process to define order parameter. These are like the viscosities are uh, different, right, in these different phases. Uh, yeah, obviously. Right. Yeah, that is what happened. Polymer simply, there are, you just imagine a chain. Suppose you, are, you have chain, lot of, this you can uh, imagine a chain which is one, uh, this, it can fluctuates, but it is a chain. But fractal is not a chain kind of things. It's like rigid. It's rigid. That's a one, each aggregate is rigid. There are many aggregates, they can actually, there are many, each aggregate is rigid. But when they combine together, this part is flexible. Once you want to apply some stress, it can turn to other case. So each arm won't like wiggle or something? Each? Each arm or something, they can't wiggle? They, no, no, this, this is kind of rigid. This is fused with high heat, around 1500 uh, temperature, this commercial made. And the velocity fluctuations, lastly, the velocity fluctuations you were measuring, those were at the zero velocity plane or something? Uh, zero velocity plane and at a particular distance, let's say here, particular distance means suppose this is from top plate, from top plate I have marked a particular distance at that particular distance, what is the velocity fluctuation, time fluctuation. And the fluctuations completely disappeared throughout the entire length when this, on, after this onset? No, once the shear thickening starts, other complication again starts because there now the proper contacts are there. So that, that, that is another complication, the, but the minima happens mostly at the onset stress. Yeah, hi Sachi. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first of them, uh, the velocity profile that you're tracking on the boundary. So do you use a tracking uh, particles or something? Like how do you uh, do that? There is, I'm using, I just, I didn't mention properly. This is the uh, particle image velocimetric tick we are using. We put, this is not exactly particle tracking. We are more or less, we are uh, at, uh, measuring the flow profiles. Similar to kind of things, but it's not exactly. So in particle tracking, we are tracking a single particles. Yeah, so I mean like to see the flow profile visually because you have a system which has uh, suspensions in it but it's homogeneously mm -hmm. mixed. So how do you see the profiles? Uh, 
uh, that we have added some stressor particles like polystyrene particles because this fume silica sample it is kind of transparent to make some to get some speckles if you don't have speckles then it is very difficult to track similar to the particle tracking kind of things you need some speckles to generate that speckles we added some polystyrene particles so that we can get some speckles and we can track the flow profile so the tracks are been like in terms of these uh, particles that you particle, have yes. okay uh, now the second question i want to ask is that in the application when you're sh showing that it can be used in like suits for uh, some uh, avoid bullet pen penetration and all uh, so if you if in terms of application these suspensions are been used and uh, over time uh, there is a issue of uh, sedimentation so how to deal with that or is there a some uh, cut off uh, packing fraction after that sedimentation doesn't happen because the standard particle that we have shown the silica and polystyrene over over a period of even just one and yeah, one yeah. day you see uh, sedimentation issue so how do you deal with so that because these, these are uh, very light actually these are very fractal in nature they are self supported sometimes so sedimentation is not an issue you are right actually there are let's say cornstarch if you don't make the density match it will settle uh, silica particle high density it will settle but this kind of system as there is a due to the fractal nature it is very light actually so it, the sedimentation is not a problem in this case uh, the silica that's why it is the uh, silica density will be high with the fractal nature the volume will be very high sedimentation rate might be different but over time uh, like uh, for example in terms of commercial uh, application if someone makes something like that and it has to be sold before it has been yeah, sold exactly. and it's been used exactly. so some uh, sedimentation might hap happen over a period of uh, like a uh, week month or year to so see the, i can say like that i have been using this thing for months i have prepared sample i have been using for the months after months also if your weight fraction is little bit high enough uh, then sedimentation is not a problem i directly can reproduce the same things but you will mix it before you do the experiment uh, no that is the okay. if you mix it the bubbles will be created so mixing will be problematic so that's why i am avoiding that so i am kind of cutting the part and loading the things maybe we can take the discussions further offline one last quick question yeah so uh, i just have uh, one uh, question is that you are saying it reentrant why are you saying it uh, uh, because uh, ideal in ideal system what happens uh, you have shear thinning you have shear thickening just like if you look at this uh, this uh, last curve you have shear thinning you have shear thickening i have not shown the other part if you apply more stress it will again decreases and that part is kind of yielding part due to the in, uh, in uh, plasticity and fractures it will again decreases that part is yielding part that's why i'm saying so this reentrant means this is this is where the viscosity actually increases and the viscosity increases happen over a order of magnitude stress but still viscosity increases but the slope actually decreases that yeah, so, uh, uh, to me it looks like it going from one strong thickening region to a uh, weak shear thickening, thickening exactly region. So reentrant usually we use is something goes to uh, another and uh, then comes. Come back. exactly. Huh. I, 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 yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. You are right. Actually, you are right. Exactly. Yeah. Let's thank the speaker for uh, answering the questions. Thank you. That concludes this session. So let's thank all the speakers of this session. In this session, we will have four talks. Each talk will be of 20 minutes, 15 plus five, and I will indicate the speaker uh, at about around 13 minutes. So our first speaker is uh, Professor Viswajit Paul. He will be talking about Indian X-ray polarimeter onboard X-ray polarimetry satellite. Okay. So as the title suggests, I will be talking about this astronomical instrument uh, X-ray polarimeter, which uh, is currently undergoing integrated tests with the spacecraft at uh, uh, URL Satellite Center, and is likely to be launched in a, a couple of months' time. Uh, this is how the spacecraft looks like. You have uh, the Polix instrument at the center with its electronics packages. And there are two smaller instruments uh, on the side, which are uh, small area spectrometers, which would also be looking at the same source uh, uh, simultaneously. And uh, you know, as you can see, a spacecraft has a lot of other uh, components on it. However, this whole spacecraft is essentially dedicated for measuring polarization with Polix. Uh, main reason is that uh, Polix requires the spacecraft to be rotating, which then is not compatible with you know, uh, most other astronomical instruments. Uh, X-ray polarization is expected from a whole range of astrophysical sources, uh, some because of their origin or some because of how they are processed on the way. I will not go into uh, details of that. 
uh, I would however tell you that uh, uh, in astronomy, you measure various things from uh, electromagnetic radiation that comes from them. You can do uh, measure the direction which would then give you imaging. You can measure uh, energy or wavelength of the photons very accurately which will give you spectroscopy. You can measure arrival times of photons accurately and if you have a large detector that gives timing. Uh, quite often observatories have many of these capabilities uh, together simultaneously like you can have very good imaging and spectroscopy instrument like what is there on Chandra X observatory or SMM Newton. You can have uh, um, uh, timing plus uh, uh, spectroscopy but not imaging. Okay. So, things come in different combinations depending on the kind of detector that you are using and so on. But X-ray polarimetry has been practically stagnant for uh, more than 40 years. The last time X-ray polarimeters were flown was in 1976 and after that there was a gap of about 45 years. In 2021 December an ASA mission has been flown and Polix is going to be the second dedicated mission. It is simply because polarimetry often is not compatible with uh, either spectroscopy or imaging or uh, 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 timing. So, you essentially do only polarization measurement or uh, 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 polarization requires a very, very large number of photons. So, these are essentially low sensitivity instruments. Okay. Whenever a space mission is uh, uh, getting launched, uh, therefore, uh, either spectroscopy imaging or timing or something else gets priority. But this thing field being largely unexplored, now a time has come where you know X-ray polarimetry is uh, you know, uh, likely to give us a lot of additional information which you cannot get from anything else. Uh, historically, this is the instrument which was flown around 1976. It is a black reflection polarimeter. You have uh, 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 quartz crystal from which X-rays are reflected and if this instrument is rotated, you can measure polarization. There were several instruments uh, which are not specifically designed for polarization measurement, but polarization one could get as a spin-off. Uh, AstroSat cadmium zinc telluride imager is one such instrument with which polarization measurement has been possible only on one source crab so far. Similarly, uh, the integral observatory European mission that had some capability of measuring, measuring polarization, but only couple of sources have been explored. Given that the uh, coming days we have IXP which is already up in uh, space, a lot of observations have been made and this is Polix. These two instruments work in complementary energy bands, so we have a lot to do and lot to do together with these two missions. Uh, basic techniques for X-ray polarization uh, uh, are as follows. Black reflection, given a crystal, it obviously works in a very narrow energy band, but very clean signal. But because it works in an area uh, narrow energy band, it is uh, not very sensitive. As we go to slightly higher energy band, what you can do is absorb the X-ray photon in a uh, very low density medium, low density gas. It, the photon would get absorbed by photoelectron process. The electron would tend to go along the electric field vector of the incident photon and cause a small ionization track. The ionization track would have a length of uh, few tens of microns okay, in a gas. If you have techniques to image that, you can measure polarization. Otherwise, in the medium energy band like 5 to 30 kV, one can use Thomson scattering. Thomson scattering, if your incident photons are polarized or a fraction of them are polarized with a net polarization degree, then you would uh, receive an isotropic Thompson scattering. At slightly higher energy, you have Compton scattering. Compton scattering has one added advantage that the point of scattering, you have an energy loss. Okay, so. We, while you measure the scattered photon, if you also can measure the energy loss during the component scattering, you can insist on these two events being simultaneous. Okay? And when you have simultaneous events, by insisting on simultaneity, you can reduce on background because these kinds of instruments are often background dominated. So, component scattering, even though it works in an energy band where you have much fewer number of photons, because of the simultaneity, even in higher energy band, you have a good enough sensitivity. Component scattering above 30 kV and Thomson scattering polarimeters in PG energy band are somewhat comparable in sensitivity. And there are efforts going on to uh, extend polarization measurement to uh, AV band and so on. Uh, as is true for most other astronomical telescopes, if you want to measure polarization from a source which location is known in space and it's uh, has certain you know uh, flux level, you need one kind of instrument. Versus when you do not know the direction of the source where your next source is going to be, but those are very bright sources, okay, like the gamma ray bursts. Uh, the instruments have to be of different kind. Uh, white field instruments typically for gamma ray burst or point in the instruments like our Polix is for known X-ray sources. So, how does Polix work? It, uh, uh, we have chosen Thomson uh, scattering which basically works between 5 to 30 kb band, but in our case we could not achieve as low threshold as 5 kb because we could not use uh, lithium as a scatterer. We are using beryllium as a scatterer, our threshold is at about uh, 8 kb, however it goes up to 50 kb. So, if you look at very bright sources, 
will be able to measure up to 50 kV or so. What you essentially do is incident photons scattered from a beryllium disk, the scattered photons if your incident photons have a direction of polarization, scattered photons would tend to go in the perpendicular direction, so that the electric field vector remains unchanged. The satellite in such cases would have some special requirement, uh, basically you need a spin around the viewing axis. In our case, the exposet has a spin at rate of about 0.2 rpm, so every 5 minutes the space curve would be rotating around the viewing axis and thereby we would measure azimuthal distribution of scattered photons uh, uh, as the space curve rotates. And given the sensitivity of this uh, instrument, we would need to look at a given source for long period like 1 to 4 weeks. But as you can see, uh, even at this rate, we would be good for about a few dozen sources in the lifetime of the mission, uh, whereas nothing exists as of now in this energy band. The uh, instrument configuration, uh, very few words. This is a collimator which is basically a collection of hexagonal holes which limits your field of view to one direction. Under this there is a scatterer, the scattered photons come and get absorbed in these four detectors. These detectors have, these are basically proportional counters which means there is a gas and in gas there are uh, <coughs> thin anode wires, we apply high voltage onto the anode wires which then work as proportional counters. So there are vertical wires running, 12 of them in each of these detectors, 12 anode cells and there are many, many cathode wires and, and so on and so forth. There is also an anti coincidence layer. So, each of these vertical anode wires work as a polarimeter. As this instrument is rotating, we will be measuring the uh, anisotropic, uh, sorry, azimuthal distribution of photons as a function of azimuthal angle. And these detectors have to be operated, so we need high voltage to be generated, high voltage to be controlled, uh, and so on and so forth. And the signal which is produced that has to be amplified, the amplified signals are brought to the processing electronics unit from which they have interface with the satellite for transfer of data, packetizing and transfer of data. And at the same time, the, all the commands uh, uh, are received through one of these packages which then are executed on the payload. And uh, the various housekeeping data, the, as the director is operating some count rates, etc., telemetered through those same telemetry card. This configuration of a polarimeter has two drawbacks. One is the scattering has low efficiency. No matter what material you are taking, you are always competing for Thomson scattering against photoelectric absorption. Okay, that is why you want to go for lower and lower atomic mass material. Plus, even after scattering, some of the photons which go in the forward scatter direction or sideways scattered will get absorbed in the material. A very small fraction actually bounces back. And after bounces, bouncing back also, many of them would come backwards toward the collimator. Some of them would get, get absorbed in the window of the collimator and so on. So eventually, you have an efficiency which is in the ballpark of 1 to 2 percent of the incident photons which will get absorbed. Plus, this is the photon collection area, whereas detector area is this into 4. So there is large internal background in this kind of systems. But given this energy band, this is roughly the best that can be done. It leaves us with uh, sensitivity, which should be good for a few dozen excess sources. This is uh, the flow chart for various you know, uh, components of this whole system. We have detectors, we have front end electronics, which has the high voltage generator, high voltage control and so on. Then processing electronics, there are four such parallel chains. Each of them also holds a housekeeping card. And then all of this data is brought to a common electronics unit, which then interfaces with the satellite. Because this is a single point failure, okay, we have a redundancy of this. If necessary, we can you know, uh, switch from one card to the other. Similarly, telemetry telecommand is uh, uh, possible through either a main system or a, a redundant system. We can uh, switch between them as necessary. So inside the detector, how it works is we have 12 anode wires, vertical. Six of them are connected in series. These are resistive wires resistive nichromas, if an event happens along uh, anywhere in this length, the pulse that is generated, it would get divided into two ends. The nearer end, because it is resistive wire, nearer would get, end would get a larger uh, fraction of the charge. So thereby taking ratio of the charges at the two ends, we can determine the position at which the event took place. And that is our main goal. We need to identify in which one of these anodes the event has taken place. And then there is this collimator, which is a simple collection of hexagonal holes. But uh, one special thing about is this, these holes are not parallel, they are tapered. Okay. We have a smaller opening on one side and a larger opening on the other side. This is for a unique reason that otherwise a collimator like this would have a triangular response. And we are trying to measure polarization by looking at small you know, modulation in the count rate. If you have a perfect triangle, a small attitude uh, error in the satellite, which any satellite is bound to have, we would already see some uh, count rate modulation. Okay. That was, uh, 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 you know, give us systematic error. To counter that, what we have done is one side the holes are slightly smaller than the other side, so that the response is flattened. Okay, so we become 
insensitive to about plus minus 0.2 degree orientation error of the satellite. So, this uh, possible orientation offset is therefore, mitigated in this manner. This is how polyps look like two of the detectors seen from inside with the scatterer here and this is how the integrated system looks like. This is polyx flight model going into thermoback chamber. These tests we completed about couple of weeks ago many people in the audience have actively participated in this process and now this instrument is getting integrated onto the satellite. Typically how does it work is if you shine mono energetic sources into the detector you get pulses which reflect the energy of the uh, events. So, uh, four detectors total eight channels uh, results are replaced, uh, displayed here. In one of these we have a gain anomaly, but a correction has been applied to that. And as these photons get detected on different parts of the detector each anode wire represents one charge ratio block. So, each of these detectors or effectively detector channels you will have these thumbs. Okay. Uh, uh, each one of these represent events recorded in one of the nodes and as this system is rotating we would basically be measuring the uh, uh, monitoring the azimuthal distribution of photons falling under each one of these pillars that is the basic uh, measurement technique. Now, there is a lot of electronics involved all of this electronics was designed developed uh, at RRI uh, by colleagues sitting here uh, except one of the cards we had contribution two of the cards we had contribution from colleagues uh, in TIFR and uh, URSC. This is the front end electronics which goes at the back side of each detector this is an older picture and these are various uh, electronics cards which are developed here. Okay. Each one of them four six sets were made four of them are going into a flight unit and two of them were part of our what is called qualification unit which has gone through all sorts of space qualification tests in ISRO uh, two three years ago. Uh, this satellite also has as I said two small spectroscopy uh, devices which would be measuring uh, you know, spectroscopy characteristics of the sources simultaneously for the sake of time I am not going into details of this. This is how we calculate uh, sensitivity of this instrument uh, in extra polarization uh, we call it minimum detectable polarizability of a given source which means if you have certain source counted from a source and certain background counted in your instrument for a observation duration of t. Uh, if the instrument has an intrinsic degree of polarization sorry uh, uh, polarization factor mu which is uh, for 100 percent incident polarization sources what modulation factor do you see okay, that is this mu. So, with this we can calculate this number minimum detectable polarizability. So, for a source of intensity r what duration of observation you need to get 5 percent uh, minimum detectable polarization that is currently how we are characterizing the instrument. Uh, once observation is done we calculate the azimuthal uh, distribution of photons and each of these anode wires will uh, be shifted in phase and we shift them correct and correct them and then add them up we are expecting signals like this. So, and what to do we do with this uh, some examples one is for example, when you look at this accretion powered excess pulses where you have a neutron star which is accreting material from a companion star the entire material falls onto the two polar regions and from there there is uh, x-ray emission there is low temperature x-ray emission which gets inverse Compton uh, scattered. Uh, in the infalling column of material and uh, they are therefore, uh, you know the gain energy become hard x-rays. This emission uh, in spite of any number of timing spectroscopy imaging observation we do not know whether the beaming is in the forward direction towards the magnetic pole or whether it is in the perpendicular direction okay, that would come up the moment we have uh, pulse phase dependent extrapolation measurement. Okay. If the emission is along the polar region we expect at the peak of the pulse to have low uh, uh, polarization factor whereas, uh, uh, if it is uh, uh, fan beam towards the equator then at the peak of the pulse we would expect to have large degree of polarization and so on and so forth. These class of sources have a hard x-ray emission they are they, they made more of hard x-rays. So, they are particularly good for polyx compared to uh, IXP the NASA mission which works in 2 to 8 kV band and we are between roughly 8 to uh, 30 or 8 to 50 kV. So, once we have polarization measurement there is a lot to study on accretion power pulsars and also I will not go into detail and also uh, interesting things to study on black hole sources. When you have a black hole and uh, x-ray radiation coming from partly from the accretion disk which is hot black body kind of emission and some of these emission get Compton inverse Compton scattered in a corona surrounding the black hole that is how we understand black hole sources now accreting black hole sources. The corona energizes these uh, soft x-ray photons they get inverse Compton scattered and produce hard x-rays. Now, the hard x-rays do not necessarily come to us directly of course, many of them will come to us directly, but some of them would get reflected in the accretion disk as well. So, there will be signature of this reflection in the emission on the other hand sometimes this accretion disk goes into a mode where the emission is mostly dominated by the accretion disk not so much from the corona 
Okay. In that case, the accretion disk can go much, much closer to the black hole and you expect to see strong polarization from the accretion disk emission as well. And depending on the spin of the black hole, orientation of the system and so on and so forth, one expects to have large energy dependence in the polarization degree and polarization angle for photons coming from black hole sources. Okay. Now, the NASA mission is measuring this polarization characteristic in between about 2 to 8 kV band and we would be measuring uh, around 10 kV band. Okay. Since you, one expects large degree of polarization, combining Polix data with the results coming out from the NASA mission, we do expect to you know, probe uh, or have independent probe of spin of black holes and, and uh, uh, other characteristics of X-ray radiation coming from such extreme sources. So, thanks all. Thanks to all of you for your attention. Polix is the ISRO mission which is going to go up if everything goes well in a couple of months time. And this is the NASA mission IXP, which has uh, focusing X-ray optics, three telescopes, photons being brought to a uh, focal plane where you have a special kind of detector. Uh, these detectors are contributed by Italian group and uh, Mirad and all and launches from NASA. So that's a NASA mission and this is ISRO mission. Uh, quite complementary and uh, working almost in the similar time frame. Thank you. We can take some questions. Yeah, I don't know. I might have asked you this question or somebody might have in earlier talks. Uh, so with your measurement combining with some other measurement, do you also know where the source is located or that is difficult? No, we are going to look at this. These are, uh, these instruments are sensitive only for very, very bright sources. But okay, you so know where the, uh, Yes, so, so already so known sources whose spectral timing, various other okay, characteristics so that's are known. Already we given. know that it's a neutron star or a black hole and so on and so forth. So most other details are known about these sources, okay. except for population characteristics. So we are only going to look at the brightest of the sources. Ah, okay, okay. And then, uh, I think you told at the end, so then what extra information you are going to gain? Uh -huh, so for example, for uh, accretion powered pulsars, we don't know what the radiation pattern is, okay? So uh, first thing to look for is uh, what is the radiation pattern, whether it is pencil beam type or fan beam type. That has not come out from spectroscopic of timing measurement any number. Second is this accretion column, there are theory of how does the accretion, what is the accretion column structure, how radiation escapes from it and so on. How does that relate with mass accretion rate? So many of these sources are very highly variable. Okay, some of these sources, for example, go into transient outburst during which their uh, intensity increases by a factor of 100 or more. Okay, so you would be able to study these sources as a function of their uh, luminosity or mass accretion rate. So that would allow us to investigate the changes in the accretion column structure. So basically, you know, how matter reacts, how matter, you know, this kind of bulk motion takes place in presence of extremely strong uh, magnetic field. Okay. So currently, all of these are hypotheses. You do not have clear observation uh, uh, or observation that would clearly uh, 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 let you choose between different hypotheses. Okay. Polarization signatures would give you uh, clear way to identify between different possibilities. Similarly, for black hole sources, black hole sources spin is measured as of now using this uh, gravitationally redshifted iron line. Okay, but there's a lot of controversy about this or uh, unanswered questions about this. For example, why does a large part of the um, iron line be gravitationally redshifted? That would require all of this to be originating very close to the black hole. What is the rest of the equation is doing? Okay. So there are a lot of, lot of unknown uh, things around uh, these systems correlation will give us additional handle. So any more questions? So I have a question. Uh, so Polix is sensitive to, uh, there are actually two types of polarization. One is linear and another is circular. Uh, in X-ray band, we only talk about linear polarization. So okay. when you measure linear polarization also, there is one degree ambiguity. Okay. Okay, that, that we only have to leave with. Yeah. Okay. That's thanks, the speaker. Thank you. So our next speaker is Deepak Patra. Spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry in a chiral bent core liquid crystals, excluded volume effect. Good afternoon, everyone. Today I am going to discuss spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry in a chiral bent core liquid crystals, excluded volume effect. In the next slide, I will des describe the uh, symmetry of chiral object and the chirality. What, is, what do we mean by chiral object? An object is called chiral if it cannot be superimposed with its own mirror image. Our hands are good example of chiral object. We cannot superimpose our left hand to right hand by any transformation such as rotation or translation. In nature, there, are, um, there will be so much chiral object. In our campus, we often see these two chiral objects. And these two are uh, interesting objects. Here you can notice this is a uh, flower 
which shows uh, double helical structure like our DNA molecule. And here, the when seed pod breaks up, it makes a two uh, spontaneously opposite handed helical structure. Initially, seed, pods, uh, seed pod was a chiral object. When it breaks up, it makes uh, some chiral object. So, spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking occurs in nature. In this context, uh, Benko liquid crystal molecular, molecular systems are known to exhibit uh, chiral symmetry breaking in the some phases. This is the typical representation of, of a Benko molecule. In th uh, theoretical study or simulation studies, we often use these two uh, model uh, type of molecules. One is called bead model, where molecule is, is made up of spherical bead, another is hard spherical cylinder model. Here beta denotes the bending angle of, the, of a molecule, bend curve molecule. And it is of order of 120 degree in experiment. Uh, because, uh, due to this, this kind of complex shape, molecule possess transverse, transverse shape polarity along this direction. Sometimes this polarization direction is called uh, king direction or bending direction of a molecule. This is a two-fold rotation axis and the long axis of the molecule is along this way. Uh, it is denoted by the blue color arrow. The molecule uh, possesses uh, two mirror plane symmetry. One is parallel to the screen and another is perpendicular to the long axis. So because of having mirror plane, the molecule is achiral. To specify the orientation of a one BC molecule in three-dimensional space, we need uh, Euler angles, theta phi and psi. Here xyz is the left frame and we are specifying the long axis of the molecule using two angle theta and phi. J is the direction which is perpendicular to L and Z. As the molecule is biaxial, so we have to specify another direction which is bending direction or polar direction, P. And we use another angle called psi, a rolling angle, which is the angle between J and P. In the next slide, I will uh, describe the symmetry of a layer using this molecule. This is a uh, schematic representation of a tilted polar symmetric layer. The, uh, this is a perfect layer. Means, uh, the perfect order means all the molecules have same orientation, same Euler angles. Because of this perfect order, the uh, average orientation of the long axis is uh, called a director, which is along this way. And the uh, layer is, po uh, this is a polar uh, layer because of all the polar direction is aligned. This is a schematic representation of a single molecule in a layer, where x y is the layer plane, z is the layer normal, so theta is the tilt angle here, j is the tilt direction. Uh, which uh, the definition of J is like that. According to this definition, J should be perpendicular to layer normal K and long axis. And it also perpendicular to the projection of the long axis on the layer plane, which is denoted by the C unit vector here, the double headed arrow. Psi is the angle between polar direction and tilt direction J. Depending on the psi values, layer can have a different kind of symmetries. Let's say psi uh, equals to 0 or 180 degree case, polar uh, direction uh, should, be perpendicular, uh, should be parallel to the xi uh, tilt direction or anti parallel to the xi direction. That's why we can get three uh, mutually orthogonal axis. One is layer normal, another is projection of the long axis, and another is uh, polar direction. Because of having three axis of a layer, we can see that the layer structure is chiral. So, symmetry would be C2 because P is a two-fold kind of rotation axis for this uh, configuration. For cycles to 90, uh, 90 degree or 270 degree, that times uh, polar direction should be perpendicular to the uh, tilt direction J. All these three axis, layer normal and projection of the long axis C and P are all in a same plane. So, this is an uh, acaral object. For other values of psi, all these axes are uh, non coplan uh, are not in a same plane. So it is a kind of uh, chiral phase whose symmetry is C1 and it is a kind of most general symmetric phase. The chirality of a layer can be uh, right-handed or left-handed uh, depending on the sign of the vector triple product. Uh, here K is the layer normal, N is the director which is parallel to the long axis of the molecule 
and P is the polar order, which is also again parallel to the polar direction of each molecule because we are considering a perfect layer order. In experiment, we mostly use, uh, uh, in experiment, we mostly observe C2 symmetric chiral layer for Bencore, acryl Bencore liquid crystal system. This is, a, this, is a, this is an another schematic representation of C2, uh, C2 layer structure. From this image, we can uh, easily say that the layer structure is chiral because this mirror image and this is not identical. So the, uh, as we know that the uh, symmetric Bencore molecule is acryl object, why uh, do the acryl Bencore liquid crystal shows spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking in the tilted polar symmetric phase? And uh, uh, then the what would be the layer symmetry of a tilted polar symmetric layer? Is it CS or C1 or even C2? To resolve this question, we utilize a different kind of approach compared to the other existing literature method. And in the next few slides, I will talk about our methods. The first experimental evidence of spontaneous uh, chiral symmetric breaking uh, was uh, discovered by Ling, uh, Ling et al. The, uh, this is a typical uh, molecule for their system. The length of the, this typical uh, this molecule should be in the order of nanometer. Recently, some Bencore liquid uh, molecule also shows this kind of spontaneous chiral symmetry breaking. Where the length scale is order of micrometer. So we can see that, uh, that these are the two different systems where the length scale are defined. Even also molecular structure, uh, chemical uh, composition of the molecule is also defined. For molecular systems, uh, the, the length scale is order of nanometer. In colloidal system, it is order of micrometer. From this uh, study, we can conclude that the shape of the geometry, uh, shape or geometry of the particle is uh, common for every, uh, these two systems. So, ge uh, so, geometry or shape of, of a particle can uh, play a significant role to determine the uh, 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 layer symmetry of a Bencore molecular system. To incorporate the shape property or geometry at minimum minimal level, we uh, consider excluded volume interaction between two uh, molecules. It is commonly known as uh, hard body interaction. Excluded volume, as we know that excluded, excluded volume is the volume which cannot be accessible due to the presence of first one for the second molecule. Here we can see the, uh, the big sphere represents the excluded region for the green, uh, green uh, spherical particle. The calculation of excluded volume uh, is a kind of a trivial task for a uh, hard spherical system. And if the volume of the excluded volume would be uh, eight times the molecular uh, spherical particle volume. But it is difficult, it is a kind of formidable task for this kind of shape uh, molecule. To compute the excluded volume between, uh, between these two type of molecules, uh, this type of molecules, we consider uh, numerical uh, tools and with some few assumptions. The algorithm uh, uh, works like this way. We consider one plane, layer plane, where molecules on the layer plane. We fixed first molecule on the uh, layer. Then we move the second molecule, soundings of the first molecule. And it, uh, at each direction of movement, we uh, determine the closest point between two molecules, this complex shape of molecules. And from that closest point of uh, closest point data, we can generate the three-dimensional excluded region. And then we compute the uh, excluded volume from there. The constant of the, uh, the constant is here, the second molecule, uh, the center of the second molecule should be on the uh, layer plane. And the, its orientation is uh, same for during the movement. To determine the closest point between two molecules, we check the, uh, the uh, non-overlapping condition. As we deal deals, uh, with two Bencore molecular system, one is bead model and another is hard sphere cylinder model. D is the distance between any two particles. So D should be greater than or equal to 2R, where R is the radius of a spherical, uh, spherical bead or hard sphere cylinder. And we use uh, the dimensionless excluded volume uh, by dividing the uh, volume of a spherical bead. 
the configuration of minimum excluded volume is kind of entropical favorable state. So, system would try to uh, uh, stabilize the, those kind of configuration where excluded volume is minimum. Here, uh, this is the result for heart uh, sphero cylinder model. Here, two molecules have same orientation, theta phi psi are uh, same for two molecules. Here, we can see the excluded volume varies with psi, psi angle and it is minimum at psi equals to 0 or 180 degree. So, that uh, means excluded volume favors C2 symmetric chiral layer and it is maximum for uh, psi equals to 90 or 270. The minima at psi equals to 0 or 180 degree arises due to the acral nature of our bn molecule. The shape of, uh, shape of the excluded volume profiles does not uh, depends on the bending angle or uh, tilt angle uh, qualitatively. So, uh, we can say that the uh, excluded volume effect for hard space cylinder model accounts for the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry because excluded volume is minimum at psi equals to 0 or 180 degree for C2 symmetric layer structure. And this scenario will change in uh, for a bead model of his uh, Bancor molecule. This is the result for a bead model. Here we can see there are four uh, profiles of excluded volume. The in the figure one, the we can see that the excluded volume does not uh, depends on psi. It is almost constant. So that signifies that the all the three layers which I am talking about C1, C2, or CS are equally probable. Uh, this region, this graph uh, corresponds to the symmetric diagram means theta and beta plane in the region one where we can get any kind of uh, symmetry of a layer. And this region associates for the higher bending angle, means bending angle is greater than uh, 120 degree and it is associated for the lower tilt angle. If we increase the tilt angle, then we will get the type 2 graph. Uh, we can see that the excluded volume, volume has a lot of minima, degenerate minima around cycles to 0 and 180 degree. This degenerate minima suggests that the C1 or C2 symmetric layer structure okay, are equally probable. This region associates with the region 2 and the type 3 where excluded volume is minima at psi equals to 0 or 180 degree. So, that time we will get only C2 symmetric layer structure. If we increasing the uh, for higher tilt case, the excluded volume is minimum only at psi arbitrary values, not 0, not 90 degree. So, we only get uh, C1 symmetric layer structure in this region. So, mostly we will find C2 symmetric layer structure from the symmetric diagram for the bead model of a molecule, bead curve molecule. This, uh, the, uh, both, uh, both a bead model and the Hertzfeld cylinder model accounts for the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. Those the, uh, though the, however, the results of excluded volume uh, is applicable for only uh, a thermal system. It is not applicable to the thermal system. In the actual system, we see temperature dependent phase transition. To accommodate that, we construct a couple XY ising model based on the excluded volume result that uh, minimum energy state would be C2 symmetric layer. Here we consider the, all the molecules are tilted with respect to the layer normal K. We consider one single layer, tilt direction is random. So, tilt direction should be an XY spin in this case and we assume that psi should be 0 or pi because of this result. And then P should be either parallel to the J or anti parallel to the J. And then we can uh, deduce this uh, definition and where sigma should be uh, plus 1 or minus 1. Uh, sigma is a kind of Ising spin here. And uh, see uh, the physical meaning of sigma is represents, it is represents the cardinality in the orientation of a BC molecule with respect to layer. Though the BC molecule is an acryl object, because of layer it is getting the chiral configuration. And we construct uh, consider this uh, is our XYIG model as uh, Hamilton for our system. The first term favors uh, the uh, alignment of tilt direction and the next term where A less than, A greater than 0 favors polarization in the system. And this is the term due to arising the uh, applied electric field. We perform the X, uh, Monte, uh, Monte Carlo simulation on a square lattice. Initially, we choose this random uh, configuration where all the spins are random. Blue color denotes the tilt direction and red denotes the polarization direction. 
a sigma equals to plus one for the right handed system, uh, right handed configuration of molecular orientation with respect to uh, layer. And these are the statistical quantities we are looking for. J is the tilde order parameter and P is the polarization and sigma is the chiral order parameter. Uh, when we are decreasing the temperature from initially random state, the system it, here all the three order parameters are zero. Then it develops uh, tilde order parameters, J is non-zero here, symmetric C region, where P and sigma are G, both zero. Even we are decreasing further temperature, then we see that the symmetric layer structure is favorable, favorable here. Uh, all the three order parameters are non-zero. The typical configuration of this uh, con uh, configuration is shown in here. And for electric field uh, run, we can see the initial state is debris symmetric where uh, all the spin, uh, spins are random. And when we are increasing the field, it is changing that polar uh, polarization develop in the system and it is going to the debris symmetric here. It is uh, an acadal structure. When we further increase the field, it is goes to the chiral symmetric uh, C2 uh, symmetric layer structure, symmetric CP. So our models predict the temperature dependent and electrophile induced chiral symmetry breaking. In summary, uh, we have numerical computed the excluded volume between two bent cone molecules, one is bead model, another is spherical cylinder model. The excluded volume uh, accounts for the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry. And we have also constructed the XY Ising model and perform the Monte Carlo simulation and the model also predicts the chiral symmetry breaking for both temperature as well as electric field. So this, uh, the details of the study has been reported in this article. So thank you for your kind attention. We can take questions. For those who okay. We fixed that uh, our, um, all the molecules are tilted. So tilt angle is fixed, which we said theta should be non-zero. But the uh, molecular uh, tilt direction, J can be random. So molecule, molecules should lie on the surface of a cone for all of the molecules. So it is uh, the kind of diffuse cone model proposed by Davies for all like molecules. So the J on the, uh, should be on the layer plane because of this definition. Her K is the layer normal and L is the long axis. So, J should be on the layer plane. So, J is like your spin with two vector, vector spin? Yeah, vector spin. Okay. So, J is the vector spin on a 2D layer? Only 2D layer. And we fixed that uh, psi angle 0 and pi. So, that times P should be parallel, either parallel to tilt direction or anti parallel to the tilt uh, direction. So, sigma can, as an Ising spin. Uh, because uh, in our excluded volume results, we see that the C2 symmetric layer structure are favorable at the ground state. So that's, uh, that's time we will get only cycles to 0 or pi. So this Hamilton does not consider explicitly the uh, chiral term. This is uh, maintained the... Uh, so this is the XY model, so you are saying from there for the C2 chiral... C2 chiral, then we even incorporate the sigma uh, Ising spin. This term is uh, one, uh, the coefficient with one, uh, this term is represents the Ising, uh, XY spin, and then the sigma is and sigma z term, it is uh, represents the couple XY Ising model. Yeah, uh, from the beginning you showed two kind of models that you started from the bead kind of structure yeah. and then, then I couldn't get that how the excluded volume actually affected by this different what? approach. When you approach bead kind okay. of model, yeah. Uh, yeah. Suppose you are considering this bead model. Suppose uh, when uh, you are asking about why the results is different. You know what exactly different you are getting. Difference you are getting from. Uh, okay. For Hartsfield cylinder model, we only get C2 symmetric layer structure is minimum. For the bead model, there can be different kind of possible symmetries. C1, C2, or CS depending on the model parameter beta, bending angle, and tilt th angle theta. For Hartsfield cylinder case, we only get C2 symmetric layer for irrespective of beta and theta. Okay. Is, that is due to internal degree of freedom. Uh, uh, means uh, when the beads uh, molecule is there, a uh, uh, molecule can kind of better uh, packed in the layer structure. Okay, yeah. So that's why it favors the all the symmetry. Okay, let's thank the speaker again.
our next speaker is Aurav Bhadra. He will be talking between the cosmic ray, knee, and ankle contributions from star clusters. Okay, so, good afternoon, everyone. I will be talking about a new idea of cosmic ray acceleration in an energy range which has remained puzzling for a long time. So, actually, cosmic rays are high energy particles which move through space with ultra relativistic velocity. And this figure shows you the spectrum of cosmic rays measured, cosmic ray flux measured at Earth. And if you focus on the x axis, you can see it uh, covers a large range from 1 GeV to 10 to the power 12 GeV energy range. Now, the general understanding is that these cosmic rays are mainly accelerated at the supernova shocks. Right. Okay, so here you can see in this video that there is an outward moving shock which has been created by the supernova explosion and one particle is getting accelerated in that shock and after gaining some maximum energy it will go out of the shock and it will propagate through the ISM. So this is the main mechanism of cosmic ray acceleration which is called the diffusive shock acceleration mechanism. Now, but theoretical calculation have shown that this method which I shown you in this video that acceleration in the supernova shocks can accelerate cosmic ray particles up to a certain energy level. So that is 10 to the power 6 GeV. 10 to the power 6 GeV energy range up to that can be accelerated by the supernova remnant and if we consider a uniform distribution of supernova remnants in our galactic plane with some injection spectrum that means every supernova remnant is injecting cosmic ray particles according to this law. Then we can calculate the um, uh, flux at earth and that will look like this. So here you can see this blue line, blue broad line shows you the total contribution of a uniform distribution of uh, uh, supernova in our galaxy and it, it, is, it can match the observation. So these are the observational data points. So it can match the obs observation up to 10 to the power 6 GeV energy. And 10 to the power 9 GeV and above, those are coming from the extragalactic origin. So there is a gap between this 10 to the power 6, this is here, and 10 to the power 9. So in cosmic literature, we call that 10 to the power 6 as knee and that 10 to the power 9 GeV as ankle. So that there is a gap between this knee and ankle, which is remain unexplained. Although we have observational data, but it is not explained well. So we propose a new idea of cosmic ray acceleration in star clusters, which is different scenario from the acceleration in supernova shocks. So star clusters is mainly a collection of huge number of stars at the center and there are continuous mass outflow from those stars which will create a bubble like structure shown in this figure. This is the simplest schematic diagram of that stellar wind bubble and there are different regions. So you can see this is the core and then there will be free wind region. Then there will be a wind termination shock denoted by WTS. Then the shock stellar wind and the outer shock. Now this wind termination shock is a very high Mach number shock. That means it is a very strong shock which can accelerate particles according to the same mechanism which I shown in the supernova case, the diffusive shock acceleration. acceleration. That means the mechanism is same but the acceleration uh, region is different for this part. This is wind termination shock. Now this simulation shows you the time evolution of a star cluster. Okay, so this is the time evolution and after some time you can see there is a formation of wind termination shock which is shown by this dark blue dark blue curve. So this wind termination shock is ex exactly same as that wind termination shock. This is the coming from the simulation of the star clusters. Now, this is a very funny example from our daily life experience that this type of super, uh, star cluster can be seen in the wash basin itself. So this is, if your flow of water is very high, then you can see this type of structure where in, the, in this region, there will be fast flow of water and there will be slow flow and in between there will be a termination shock. This is a very, you can see it in everyday life that a, a star cluster type of morphology is forming at the basin. So now that we have chosen the star cluster as an uh, alternating, alternative site for cosmic ray acceleration, this is, this is not ad hoc because the background why we have chosen the star cluster as the potential site is coming from the gamma ray observation, recent gamma ray observation. So this is a gamma ray observation from a star cluster by Fermilat and if we want to explain this gamma ray observation, we need to invoke the cosmic rays. 
because if the cluster accelerate cosmic rays, those cosmic rays while propagation they will interact with the ISM protons that is the protons which is in the interstellar medium and due to that interaction pions will create pi 0 and there will be pi plus pi minus also but this pi 0 will decay into two gamma rays. So, this gamma ray detection is an indirect evidence of the cosmic ray acceleration in the star clusters. So, this is the uh, observational motivation of choosing the star cluster and also uh, Gupta et al in his paper he shown that the cosmic abundance of 22 neon by 20 neon can be explained if we consider the star cluster as the uh, site of the cosmic ray acceleration. So, these are the observational and theoretical background of choosing star cluster as the origin of cosmic rays. Now, this is the quick summary that I have told you there are two types of cosmic ray acceleration that is supernova and stellar wind bubble or the star cluster and we are mainly focusing on this WTS or wind termination shock part. Okay, so, till now I have told you about the acceleration. Now, to prove our hypothesis, we need the distribution of star clusters in the galaxy. So, here it is a, suppose this is the galactic plane and clusters are distributed all over the galactic plane and that distribution follows a Gaussian like structure. Where uh, the x axis is the distance from the galactic center, and if uh, you can see that Gaussian curve has a peak around 4.6 kiloparsec. And for the convenience, I have shown the position of the Earth, which is, which, which is at a distance of 8.5 kiloparsec from the galaxy, galactic center. And this curve can be expressed by this uh, expression also, and all the parameters I have written down, which is taken from this particular paper. So, this was about the distribution of the clusters in the galaxy, and this is the injection spectrum of each, in each cluster which is uh, a function of total momentum, p is the momentum and it has an exponential cutoff of p max and this p to the power minus q is actually the signature of the diffusive shock acceleration I told uh, at the first beginning. Okay, so now all this was the about the acceleration. Now the point is particle have, has been accelerated, they have to propagate through the ISM. So the propagation equation of the cosmic rays can be written down like this, where this first term is the diffusion term the second one NV sigma is an interaction term that means the cosm during propagation cosmic rays are interacting with the ISM particles and they are losing energy that is why the minus NV sigma term is there and Q is the source term of cosmic rays. So, this source term is a function of both momentum and space special dependent part. So, the special dependent part is exactly coming from the distribution of the clusters and the momentum dependent part QP is coming from this injection spectra. So, we have all the information to solve this equation and if we solve this analytically then we will get the uh, solution like this where n is actually the number density of cosmic rays at a distance of r from the galactic center with momentum p and 0 denotes that the we are considering the galactic plane. So, this is the value in the galactic plane. So, although this uh, expression looks a bit messy, now let us pl plot it as a function of energy. So, if we plot that n times E cube, so intensity is uh, generally uh, same as the n with some factors and uh, we multiply that with E cube in the y axis. So, the plot will look like this. This is the observed flux which is predi predi predicted by our model that is measured uh, at the earth position and this is the energy. Rate. So, uh, we have considered eight different elements from proton to iron and each, each plot, uh, this thin type plot shows the elemental flux of different elements. And if I adapt, uh, if we adapt those all uh, contribution, this is the total contribution which is shown by the solid maroon line. And this, so this contribution is entirely coming from the star clusters. And for the E max, uh, that E max is important because here I showed you there is a uh, cutoff at P max. P max is the momentum associated with the maximum energy E max. So E max has been calculated from a famous Hilas criteria. Now, if you in, uh, use appropriate values of magnetic field, LPC is the uh, extension of the accelerating region, then you will get the E max for proton as 4 into 10 to the power 7 GeV. And for other elements, there will be an extra factor of Z with uh, proton number Z. So, that is why you can see that uh, that proton, that black curve has a cutoff at uh, around 4 into 10 to the power 7 GeV. And there is one parameter, one free parameter that is the how much fraction of the total energy cluster uh, cluster wind, uh, star cluster wind energy is going into cosmic rays that is kept as a free parameter and by matching the observational data points with the uh, theoretical predicted value we have got the value as 5 percent that means 5 percent of the total uh, cluster energy is going into cosmic rays. Now, as I told you at the uh, beginning that 10 to the power 6 GB and below is dominated by the supernova uh, 
uh, part, supernova component, 10 to the power 9 GV and above is the dotted part is coming from the extra galactic. So with these two components, if I adapt the star cluster component, which is coming from our model, then this is plot can be produced, which is uh, which can explain the all particle spectrum from 1 GeV to 10 to the power 11 GeV. So you can see this solid maroon is the this same component as this blue star, uh, supernova remnant. This dotted is this extra galactic part. And this dashed maroon is the this, exactly this uh, component, which has been added with the other two components. So that's why, so with all these three components, we can explain the all particle spectrum. And this second component, which we uh, propose that is necessary to explain the observational data in this point with, between the knee and the ankle. Now, this, is, this was all about the cosmic ray, total cosmic ray flux. Now, we have also measured the elemental abundance of cosmic rays. That means the mean logarithmic mass. So this plot actually tells you about the composition of cosmic rays. That because cosmic rays is not only hydrogen or not only helium. It is a combination of different elements. So this uh, ln a is a is the mass number of different elements and it, it can be calculated like this. Now if you calculate from our model then the curve will look like this and these are the observational data points. So although uh, we are getting a good match with the observation in, in the range of 10 to the power 8 and above, but there it is somewhat below than the observation, but we are safe because these are the upper limit. So we are, we are well below the upper limit and the um, observational points are matching with the De, de, uh, observational points are matching with the uh, proposed theoretical model in this energy limit. Okay, and this is the abundance of uh, cosmic rays in the stellar wind, which we uh, have calculated, which we have taken from Arpita Roy. Uh, she has used some uh, simulation of stellar uh, lifetime. So from that, we have taken this. Now, so we can explain all particle spectrum as well as the mean logarithmic mass plot with our proposed uh, star cluster model. Now, another obvious question is, is, I will skip this one. No. So, is there any other model which can also explain the observe, uh, cosmic rays in that in, uh, 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 9 GeV energy range? So, there is a model which is existing that uh, is from Thoudam et al. 2016 paper. They have considered the cosmic ray acceleration in galactic uh, termination wind. So remember, it is in the galactic scale, what I have told that is from the star cluster wind termination shock, but it is the galactic wind termination shock and cosmic ray particles can be accelerated in this shock also, which can explain this exact region, the 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 9 GeV, which we are focusing. But the problem is, although with their model, they can explain the to all particle spectrum, but if you go to the mean logarithmic mass plot, you can see this blue line is coming from the mean log. Uh, is coming from that thodium et al model and this green as well as red uh, is coming from our model that the red is actually we have considered different type of extra galactic extra galactic cosmic rays so two different uh, curve is for two different type of extra galactic origin which we have used in our uh, work but in this particular energy range 10 to the power 8 to few times of 10 to the power 9 gev our prediction is uh, matching well with the observation but the thodium et al 2016 paper prediction it is exactly opposite to the observational change. Whereas it is going to a lower side, but the uh, uh, blue curve is going to a higher side. It is exactly opposite. So although they can explain the all particle spectrum here, but they cannot explain the mean logarithmic mass plot with their uh, proposed model. So we can say that our model is uh, a better uh, to understand the, all, uh, the cosmic ray spectrum in this 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 9 GeV energy range as well as the mean logarithmic mass plot can also be explained by our proposed model. So this is the main result and conclusion that uh, the cosmic rays originating from a distribution of star cluster can explain the particle into 10 to the power, few times 10 to the power 6 to 10 to the power 9 actually. And star cluster is favorable over the galactic wind component. So galactic wind is this blue curve, which I told you. And this is some benchmark estimate that 5% of the total energy is going into the cosmic rays, total wind energy. And the cutoff, that is the Pmax or the Emax, is actually z into 5 times 10 to the power 7 GeV. So thank you very much. That's from my side. So we can take question. Uh, yeah. So I have two questions. So one is, so you showed this simulation, right? No, it is not exactly simulation. No, no, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my, I have not started my question. So you, okay, whatever it is. Yeah. So, uh, so, so what is it actually? I mean, like, is it a simulation? I mean, this. Terms of some, no, no. 
See, there's this simulation you showed which just keeps evolving, no? There's a video okay, you okay. showed, yes, sir. right? That's yeah. a simulation. That's right? a simulation. Yeah. So, so what is this simulation? Is it like in terms of some microscopic model or it's some in, at the terms of, in terms of some density field or what is that simulation? So the point is in this simulation, we choose a particular volume. And then in that volume, we uh, inject energy. So this energy is injected in that volume. It will evolve with time so, according so to the... Continuous equation of the energy field. Dynamics. Yes. Sorry? It's an energy field you are evolving? Yes, it is an injection of energy. It, uh, kind of Navier Stokes kind of equation? Yes. I mean, not Navier Stokes. We will uh, solve so the mass conservation. So, some continuity equation you are solving. Exactly. Right? Okay. Momentum conservation. Some con continuity equation you are solving. Yes. Okay. So, it's okay. So, you uh, and is there any noise also or inhomogeneity is coming from what? Like, uh, or it's a deterministic equation or there's some noise also? No, I, I mean, this are, we use some uh, software called Pluto. So Pluto actually solved the, no, those. Whatever it is, inside, uh, Pluto, inside Pluto there's some uh, equations, right? Yes, those equations they uh, generally solve. Yeah, so that's right. I, I, are this like a, my, my, no, he said it's not microscopic model. So it's, I think, at the level of continuity equation. Yes. Continuity equations, Pluto right? Continuity equation. Yeah, but then is there also any noise or there is no noise? It's just the desire, because you had this rugged boundaries. Oh, that right? is exactly coming for yeah? the yeah? assumption of the uh, uh, surroundings, because uh, it is not exactly spherical. If you consider exactly spherical thing, then it will be a circular type. So this is because of the initial condition, yes. is it? Yes. It's just because of the initial yes. condition. Okay. Okay. Because of the asymmetry of the problem. Mainly. Okay, so you have a deterministic equation with a, an, uh, an isotropic initial condition. Actually, that is the thing because that simulation is not from my work entirely. Ah, okay. That is, I have taken from my senior. Okay. So he can answer it in, I mean, okay. deep way. Okay. Yeah. I had another question. So actually, I think I forgot anything. That was taken from Siddharth Gupta's uh, work. Uh, okay. Yes. So this the uh, yeah the other thing is a, a quick question maybe. So you saw this particle inside this shock, mm -hmm. right? Then particle exactly and suddenly it comes out. Of, yeah, this was right. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a way to physically way to understand like yes, uh, actually, how this it is gaining this energy from this and like it has so much energy that it just comes out of it? Uh, yeah, actually, it is a uh, phenomena which is called the magnetic mirroring phenomena. Okay, so. Actually, the situation is this particle is like trapped in between that region. And every time it gets reflected from that particular, if you consider it like a rigid wall, that gains some energy. Because uh, that energy, I mean, if, if you... If I have a particle bouncing between two walls, it doesn't gain energy by itself, right? Uh, no, it is like the te uh, like tennis ball. When you hit a tennis ball from this side and another person hit a tennis ball from that side, in between that, so you have it gains some energy. Okay, so there is some, every collision you input some energy to the particle, is it? It is a rigid dual. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I understand, but I, I mean like you are saying that you are in somewhere and suddenly you are just out of it. So that means, uh, so if a shock is, if a wall is coming towards you and if a particle is going towards that wall, mm -hmm. so I, suppose it has the velocity capital V, it has a velocity of small v. So if you go to that wall frame, it, the wall will see that particle is coming with velocity V plus, capital V plus small v. And after reflection, it will go with a minus capital V plus small v. So there will be a change of uh, energy if you g come back to the left frame. So that change is actually 2 of capital V, which is the velocity of that residual. So as this shock has also a velocity which is acting as a residual, that V is actually energizing the particles, that delta E, which is changing, which, which will be a function of delta V, I mean capital V. So that's how we, uh, I mean, acquires energy with each reflection. Mm -hmm. Okay. I just have a very basic question, which is that in these star clusters, so I understand how this happens through the Fermi acceleration for the shock wave. But a star cluster is something that I would imagine, what is the dynamics there that, I mean, these are, uh, are they highly dynamical uh, star clusters or what is a, I mean, in a yes. supernova versus that seems much more static on long, ter long time scales. Yes. So what is the dramatic process that is happening there that can create this level of acceleration? Okay, that is the main part is in supernova, you can think it as an energy injection at 
a particular time. At the instant of time, it is uh, releasing some energy. But this star cluster is a continuous process. It is not an instantaneous thing. So as there is continuous mass outflow, sorry, continuous mass outflow, uh, so it is at the beginning, it will act like a supernova itself. But here the wind termination shock, which is, so actually, the, he, due to the radiation pressure of those stars. So OB stars, generally we consider OB stars, which are very massive stars, those has a very large amount of radiation pressure, which will create a continuous outflow of mass from its surface. So, and the wind velocity is um, nearly 2,000 kilometer per second. So this wind termination shock will see actually that uh, that mass is coming from the center towards me with a velocity of 2,000 kilometers. Yes. I mean, uh, no, no, no. This is the exactly different. This star cluster generally release mass, not accretion. Accretion. Yes. So massive stars are in the central. That is the uh, understanding because massive star will form at the densest part of a molecular cloud. And the densest part will come at the cent very center of the molecular cloud. So there is the surrounding is generally a molecular cloud in where the star clusters form. Uh, yes, that, I mean, for a particular thing, I have done it, I mean, in this, what is that? So, in the first paper I have done, so, for a, there was a star cluster, few, uh, a recent detection, so, this is the gamma ray map of Western one, a, particular, a star cluster, and from the cosmic ray acceleration, I have tried to explain this gamma ray map, and uh, somehow, uh, we have uh, done that, that we can explain. So, for this uh, cluster, it can uh, go up to TeV even. I mean, 10 to the power uh, 3 GeV and beyond. That can be accelerated. So that depends on the morphology of the star clusters also. How, how, what, uh, as I told, uh, shown you that E max expression. So it is a function of a magnetic field LPC. LPC is the accelerating region where the maximum acceleration is happening. And that is for the star cluster is this region, the soft stellar wind part. So particles are coming from the center, it is getting accelerated. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Because star formation rate will tell you the whole morphology of that particular system, how, what will be the extension, everything. It can, but uh, the point is, for that, we need the gamma ray detection for those bright sources as well. So there are not much gamma ray detection till now. There is two or three star cluster for which it has been detected. Uh, sort of, uh, what I uh, understood from your talk and all, that all trials are uh, done with the diffusive shock acceleration, yes. uh, I mean, as a uh, accelerating engine. But there is this uh, turbulent reacceleration for me to kind of yes. uh, acceleration. Is there any uh, work uh, on that? Because uh, this uh, ICM or even IGM is uh, dominated by turbulent energy. So, so, I mean, that we have not taken, we have already taken no, the any diffusive work part. you know that? Uh, that I have to go through. Uh, at that moment, I cannot tell okay. you. Uh, yeah. I will let no. you know later. Yeah. So, yeah. let's yes. thank the speaker okay. and move to the next speaker, uh, Professor Sanjeev. Sabha Pandit, he will be talking about Brownian motion with stochastic diffusion coefficient. So I thank the organizers uh, keeping the tradition alive. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so as you know that we recently had this uh, showcasing RRI, so like uh, this year was singular, so everybody, almost, almost all faculties gave very long talks. So that was the reason this year I thought I will not talk, but then, okay, you asked to talk me on, uh, talk me about something. Uh, so I decided to talk about something uh, which probably I wouldn't have talked otherwise. It's basically like a part of some work. Uh, 
uh, but it's fairly basic. I thought that uh, okay, it might be appealing to the broad audience. Okay, uh, so this is okay. I mean, this is some work we have been doing with Urna and Ion, who is in the audience. So I'm going to talk about. Uh, So I think this first part is, uh, I think all of you know by now in this audience, but there's something with this, with, uh, stochastic, and coefficient. So of course, a Brownian motion, uh, all of you know that. So if you have a, even Ion was uh, discussing in his talk. So if you have a, a particle, let's say, a pollen particle or cholesterol bead, a polystyrene bead, sorry, in water, and if you look at its displacement, so what you see is that so it's governed by something like this, okay? Eta of t. And this eta is a, so you assume that it's a Gaussian white noise. So it's a random variable drawn from Gaussian distribution with mean is 0 and the variance or the correlation is basically the Delta correlated. Okay, and this, so it's a fairly uh, uh, generic equation, not only in pollen grain, but I mean it has a wide applications. For example, people even find this application in finance, or I mean, I think any, I mean, very has different thing because this is the simplest stochastic equation you can write down. So as you can imagine, that this has basically various applications. So for the pollen grain in water, usually this diffusion coefficient is related to the uh, temperature and the uh, uh, viscosity, but for other problems, you can just think it is like a parameter. Okay. And this equation, what it says is that okay, x of t uh, is given by square root of 2d times 0 to t eta t prime dt prime. Right? I'm just integrating this equation, and I'm just assuming that uh, without any loss of generality, that x zero is just zero. Okay? So I can always just take a measure from it already. Okay? Now, the a very interesting property about Gaussian random variable is that if you combine Gaussian random variable, okay, you add to Gaussian random variable with, in fact, any arbitrary coefficient, the summation or integration in this case will always be a Gaussian. Okay? Any linear combination of Gaussian variable is a Gaussian. So therefore, this P of x t will be a Gaussian. So it will be given by square root of 2 pi some variance minus x square by sub sigma t square. Okay? So mean will be 0 because if you take the mean of this one because mean and that this integral they commute. So, it is just a basically mean of this random variable which is 0. So, therefore, the mean is 0. So, all you have to compu uh, compute is the variance. Right? And it is very easy to compute the variance because what you see is that x square is just square root of 2d times square root of 2d that gives you 2d times you have two integrals. right? So, 0 to t dt prime. 0 to t dt double prime and then you have this correlation of eta t prime eta t double prime and this correlation is delta. So, therefore, one integral goes away and then the other integral just gives you t. Right? So, therefore, this is just equal to 2 dt. So, it is very simple and we all know this one. Right? Okay. So, now so imagine that, so this is the most basic Brownian motion. Now imagine that this d is not a constant. 
Okay. So, for the time being, I am just talking about 1 d, you can easily generalize to higher dimension. So, if suppose d is a d of t, okay, it is a deterministic function of t. Okay. So, this equation is still valid. right? So, x of t is square root of 2 0 to t square root of d t prime d t prime mean is still 0 right and now when you compute the variance so therefore this is okay 2 so eta is still delta correlated so this 2 integral will go away so you will have one integral and t and t prime same in that integral so what you have is that d t prime so, therefore, even in this case x of t is again a Gaussian for any deterministic function of d of t. Right? So, you will have some thing where p of x t is again square root of 2 pi sigma. Now, it is some function of t which will depend on this one. So, in that case it was just a simple function of t it is just 2 d t, but it will depend on the whatever the precise this thing of t, but it, this is still valid okay, sigma t, this is still valid. Okay. So, now the question we wanted to ask, so what happen if d of this d is not a deterministic function of t, but it is again a another stochastic variable. Right? So, so, you have this equation, but this still is it's a stochastic. Equation. So, you can think of it. So, okay, so we came into okay, this problem from some uh, other context. So, that context I am not going to discuss it today. Maybe I can uh, talk about it something. But one way, of, one of the maybe uh, I do not know if you if I can convince you, but one of the way to think why you would consider something why this uh, d of t is a stochastic variable. For example, suppose you are in a medium and this medium is changing. Okay. Um, okay, simplest example I can think of is like okay, so you are in a medium and the temperature is changing, you are heating the medium. Okay. So, temperature will increase, but of course, there will be fluctuation. Okay. So, it is not a deterministically increasing, there will be fluctuation, and if you take into those fluctuations, so what happened? If your distribution it still remains Gaussian or it is something completely different. So, that is the question we wanted to address. Okay. So, again I will keep it very simple. So, my equation is that okay, in one dimension d x d t equal to square root of 2 d of t times eta of t, but in this case now I am going to assume that it is it's some stochastic process. Again, I will consider the simplest stochastic process. Of course, what kind of stochastic process it is depends on the context. And as a first step, let me just consider the simplest stochastic process. And simplest stochastic process is the Brownian motion itself, as I said. Okay. So, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, the distribution is Gaussian. So, this variance determines all the other moments. No, you get this this from the fact that x of t is a linear, it linearly depends on eta, and eta is a Gaussian random variable. Yeah, or basically, yeah, basically what happens is any linear combination of Gaussian random variable is a Gaussian random variable, basically. Yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter any function you can take, uh, det but deterministic. So, now this one, so I will consider a simplest stochastic process. So, of course, you want this d to be positive. Okay. So, therefore, I will go, going to consider something like that omega square t, which is positive, of course. And I am going to assume that d omega dt, it is again a some other Brownian motion. Okay. So, this equation is essentially same as this equation right in some other variable. Okay. So, this is the model. Okay. Now, the question is what do you get when you solve this model. Okay. Uh, 
So, how much time do I have? I have four minutes, right? Oh, this is uh, gone or this is uh, this is a back, right? Okay. So now, okay. So let me then uh, just state the result. Okay. So before stating the result, uh, so basically, what you can show, okay, this might be interesting to some people who are mathematically oriented. See now you have, although you are interested in the distribution of x, right? You need to consider distribution of x and omega together. So you have to basically look at what is the joint distribution of x and omega, and it satisfies the equation which is like del p del t is equal to. Uh, let me just write down omega square del 2 p del x 2 plus this equation with the initial you know that it is a single derivative is time double derivative here double derivative here. So, you need one initial condition. So, the initial condition is that okay, p of x omega at 0 is you start with the origin and also you start with omega equal to 0. So, these are product of this delta function and you assume that p of x omega at any time t goes to 0 when x goes to plus minus infinity or omega goes to plus minus infinity. So, you have this sufficient number of initial and boundary conditions. And so, you want to write down the position distribution now. So, okay, it turns out that you can actually solve this equation. And so, p of x t now you do not consider what is uh, you do not care what the final omega is. So, this is basically what you have is that you compute the joint distribution and you integrate out omega. So, this is called the marginal and it turns out that this has this nice scaling form for lambda t some function of x by 4 lambda t. So, immediately you notice that this scaling is different from the scaling you have in other Brownian motion because Brownian motion x goes like square root of t. So, there is a diffusive scaling. So, here what you have is a ballistic scaling basically. So, it is basically x goes like t. Imagine that it just goes right and this function turns out that you can actually uh, find out exactly and it is a scaling function. So, function of just one variable let us call it y and this function is it's an interesting function actually 3 by 2 and then product of 2 gamma function 1 fourth plus i y times gamma of 1 fourth minus i y. Okay. You can plot it. So, it basically if you just look at a, what is the tail of this thing for large y. So, this goes like uh, 1 by okay, so this is a 2 by pi y exponential of minus pi y. So, now, so this is basically a distribution you can compute it exactly for this model. So, in fact, you can generalize it to higher dimension any d dimensions. So, now for Brownian motion you know that okay, d dimensional problem is very simple because it is just a product of one dimensional problem right. Because your each components are independent, right. So, if one direction is Gaussian in d dimension it is a product of Gaussian, right? but here this is not the case because so now if you take this model and write for its direction, but this diffusion coefficient is common for all directions. So, therefore, this all the directions are not decoupled they are correlated and still it is isotropic. Uh, there is no this thing and you can again find out that distribution even in d dimension. Uh, okay, so, it yeah I do not know I can write it down, but okay, it, it has some uh, maybe let me just write down the okay. So, you can in fact write down the distribution in d dimension and since it is isotropic you can just actually look at the radial distribution. Okay. The radial distribution has all the information. So, radial means basically if you just look at the 
this one x 1 square plus x 2 square plus x d square. So, this x s are the various component. So, then the radial distribution r of t. So, again it has this scaling form. So, this uh, similar scaling form basically for lambda t some scaling function which depends on d times uh, r by 4 lambda t and okay, this function is in fact uh, okay, it has some I do not know why I am writing down, but okay, let me just write it down. No, it is the fact that you can actually write down uh, explicitly infinity some d by 2 minus 1, some d by 2 minus 1, kappa z divided by cos hyperbolic kappa by 2 times kappa z kappa. So, this you can write down in any dimensions and uh, so interestingly it turns out that in odd dimension in fact you can actually do this integral and you can even write down a even more explicit form but let me not write it down and again for large uh, argument basically when you, uh, the argument becomes very small uh, very large sorry so it has this scaling form it has, sorry it has this asymptotic form so Pi z by 2 d by 2 minus 1 exponential of minus pi z as z goes to infinity or z this must must get added more. So, it has this uh, universal tail basically for uh, any dimension. Okay. So, we came into okay, so so it so when we came across this problem, so okay, we are doing something related to some model of some bacteria and under certain limit we arrived in this equation, but it turns out that okay, people have been also looking at this kind of problem basically uh, motion of see Brownian particle is basically any degrees of freedom you basically look at how it relaxes and in some evolving media it turns out that basically people consider this kind of Brownian motion of stochastic diffusion coefficient basically. Okay. I just thought. We can take quick questions. Yeah, This is a very quick question. That uh, equation that you have, uh, you know, the for the probability, yeah. it looks like an anisotropic diffusion uh, thing, right? Because if you have omega and lambda mm -hmm. being different, mm -hmm. it looks like a two-dimensional uh, spatial dimensions with, but with omega and lambda different. So can you think of it also like that because it yeah. is reduced down to uh, something which two different kind of diffusion terms. Uh, you, mm -hmm. Just a question, can you think about it like that? Is it useful to think about it like that? In which case, is it true in general that when you have such a thing with the diffusion constant not the same in all directions that you would expect similar kind of ballistic uh, behavior? Ah, no, 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 it's not true because uh, you forgot about this omega. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 yeah. So, uh, one can say that it is a generator of distribution, right? Because you started with Gaussian for eta and uh, at chi or xi. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you get an exponential distribution. Yeah, yeah. So, that's a generator of distribution. So, you can create different distribution out of that kind of. You can create different kind of distributions, but then again, uh, okay, this you, if you have a uh, slightly, yeah. So for example, uh, if you take a okay, so so if you take a, instead of this one, suppose you take d two omega d t two equal to this one, right? So that will give you a different scaling. Probably it will come as a three by two or something like that, basically. Then you will get another distribution. Then you will get another distribution because your diffusion coefficient is evolving by a different stochastic uh, dynamics, right? That you know, that you know because if this is constant, you have a different uh, distribution because that's just Gaussian, yeah. right? Yeah. So in fact, that kind of equation used in disorder system also uh -huh. because then, like you can you can start with let's take uniform distribution and you get Lorentz distribution mm -hmm. for your. 
Oh, okay, okay, okay. So that's called light model. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Ah. No, with, with, with this varying uh, fluctuating D. Ah. So at long time, what happens? It becomes constant? No, 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 no. This one, no? No, no, no uh, this one. This, yeah. is, this, this is, see, Y is a scaling function, X by T. Okay. So it will go like exponential of minus X by T. Hmm. So it's not constant. Instead the of Gaussian tail, you have an exponential tail. So X by T and then there is outside one by one yeah, T. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it is... Uh, 1 by t square, is it? No. No, uh, no, yeah, there, uh, no, uh, no, 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 it will be… This will be x by t. Uh. This will be x by t, this will be x by t. Uh. So, that's the distribution. Like, see, if you have a Gaussian, for example… Uh, Basically, I want to know uh, what happens to Pxt at very long time. It will still keep evolving. Like, yeah. uh, that asking, like, uh, for example, uh, Brownian motion, right, uh. p of xt. So, this is 4 uh -huh. pi dt exponential of minus x square by 4 dt, right? Uh -huh. Even at very long time, uh -huh. it will still evolve, it will have the same distribution. The, so, this guy will start with something like that and then this will go something like that, okay, this is symmetric, so it's just, okay. It will flatten and con almost go constant, right? But almost depending on the, because your space is also uh -huh. infinity, okay. right? If you have a finite box, of course, it will become uniform mm. in both cases, okay. but your space is also infinity. Okay. So, this is at all time this equation is true, this whatever expression is true. Okay. So, okay. it will become, everything will become smaller, mm. but here it will grow, okay. right? Okay. So, this, all this probability where going down here, it will come up somewhere, no? Because okay. the integral is uh, 1 still, right? Yeah. So, it is the same with that one. Yeah. Okay. So, except that this growth here, it is uh, grows uh, uh, diffusively, the scale is square root of t. In that case, if you plot, okay, I do not know what is the, okay, this distribution. So, it will have some, this thing, but, okay, it is, forget about this thing, okay, something like that. And then, it, it, you will have some other tail. And this tail grow like uh, t, not square root of t. So, here it will go like uh, square root of t. Yeah. So, one last question. No, no, it will be very different. For example, if you have a noise, okay, that uh, original mother, forget, yeah, D is constant, noise is different, it'll be, right? It will be very different. So, if you have an, for example, if, if your noise is exponential or something, then you will have two regimes. One regime is your typical regime. Your typical regime will still be Gaussian, the regime where you are looking at the fluctuation at the scale of square root of t at large time. But you will also have a atypical regime which will have large fluctuation and that will be described by something called large deviation function and that large deviation function will be very different from this one. And if you take something like a, a Levy distribution or something here, for example, then you will have a distribution which even the second moment does not exist, for example, right. So, that depends on, yeah. So, there are some what they call it stable distribution, like Gaussian is one stable distribution. So, that is why any linear combination of Gaussian is always a Gaussian, uh, but there are other stable distribution. In general, they call it alpha stable distribution. So, finally, if your D is constant, the typical fluctuation will converge to one of the alpha stable distribution. Basically. Yeah. So, let us thank the, all the speakers of the session.